Good afternoon, folks. My name is Jimmy Bashar with the ISO Stakeholder Affairs Group. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the California ISO Stakeholder Call to discuss penalty prices and scheduling priorities in our market. As you may know, we are currently addressing these issues throughout our Business Practice Manual, or BPM, Change Management Process. Our BPMs, as you know, outline in more detail our current tariff requirements, with the change benefit process being the mechanism through which we address any BPM clarifications, or as we call them, uh, proposed revision requests. And this particular BPM discussion has been assigned PRR 1282, for those keeping up on that end. And we are happy to have this larger call today to discuss it with the stakeholder community, of course. In addition, I'd like to caveat that with, uh, while we do anticipate that we'll potentially receive much feedback um, on some options to consider, uh, this is, of course, the first discussion on this in this fashion, and we are, of course, happy to table uh, any such future considerations. In addition, our calls and webinars are recorded for stakeholder convenience, allowing those who are unable to attend to listen to recordings after the meeting. Recordings will be publicly available on the ISO webpage for a limited time following the meeting. Of course, the recordings and any related transcriptions should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. And lastly, of course, if you have any questions, uh, we do encourage verbal questions only. However, if you see any chat questions, we'll do our best to field those as well. Uh, but please raise your hand virtually by pressing pound two. And we, of course, uh, please request that you state your name and the company that you represent. And with that, I'll hand it over to Guillermo. Thank you, Jimmy, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for making the time. This is a Friday afternoon. May not be the most exciting topic to have on a Friday afternoon. Sorry for having this scale, but there are always challenges to make it happen for a three-hour workshop. And with that in mind, I think we are scheduled to go all the way through 4 p.m. Pacific time, and we may have to have to stop here. Uh, as Jimmy indicated, this is the first workshop that we are expecting to have for this topic. Based on the discussion that happens today, based how far we are able to go through the material, and hopefully we can go through all the material, but if not, we can still stop here and resume in the second session. And uh, based on the questions that we may receive and the feedback that we can get, we may schedule and we may have the need to, to have a second workshop, and that is still a feasible item that we are going to consider. Uh, the workshop that we are organizing for this afternoon is really to go through the basics. And uh, there, are, there are many questions we have received through this effort of the BPM change. And obviously, different people may have different levels of expertise and understanding of how the current practice of the Kaizo market is. And I would appreciate that uh, you give us the opportunity to go through the material, even though some of those topics may be already too basic for some of you. I would appreciate that for the sake of leveling the understanding of everybody, we have the opportunity to really walk through constantly and programmatically through all the material. If you have a question that may not be applicable for the current discussion, but subsequent uh, slides may cover that, uh, we may have to defer your question until we really reach the, the topic that is applicable for. And uh, everything is interrelated, and you will see that we try to put a, a natural flow of how to bring the different items for discussion. Obviously, at some point, there is no need to, there is no way to prevent uh, a new concept to be in the picture uh, when we are discussing a specific, a specific other item, and that is the nature of having all this all together. But we try to do the best effort we put to, to make it flow more naturally in terms of the, of the concept. And uh, the purpose of having this workshop is really because all the feedback we got when we implemented the VPN change. As you may recall, when we were going through the heat wave of August, early September, uh, we implemented a business practice change through our regular business practice manual change process that we have. And that took effect on September 5th, 2020. And we have two types of BPM process. One that is the standard one that goes through the beginning of the month. We have a 60-day calendar 
period to go through the feedback and implement it. But we also have the other pathway that is an emergency change to take effectively, effective immediately. And we took that path, obviously, because we wanted to effectuate the change as soon as possible into the market operation. And that is a process that we have in place and is purposely in place for this type of situation when we really have to expedite the, the implementation of, of the change, of the practice change. And this is what we did on September 5th after we implemented the change that is as of today is still in effect. And we still continue to have the regular steps of the process, which requires to have some uh, common review period feedback from participants. And through that process, we still receive several questions and comments. And when you see all this in place, you wonder whether it was better to pause a little bit to these revisions and comment periods to try to have this type of discussion first. Uh, and then the need really is to ensure that we provide an opportunity for have an open discussion about what the current practice is. And that is the whole reason why we were having this workshop today. Uh, next slide, Jimmy. Uh, trying to put the background on what we did, and we're going to discuss in way more detail this through the workshop through this afternoon. When we implemented this change, the PRR 1282, uh, we effectively had two changes of practice. One related to the residual unit commitment process, that is the ROC they had process, and the second one is the pro uh, a change that we implemented in the real time related to the rock process. So they are interrelated and they affect naturally very well together. And that is the reason they came as a bundle of one BPM change. The first change is really to change the, the way we produce the market solution in the rock process. And as we discuss later, the effective change that took place was to move the solution from the scheduling run when originally it was the pricing run. And we have had this type of solutions all the time. It's a matter of which one we use for downstream applications. And there is a long history that we're going to cover in more detail later. The second change was the reference when we have to assign a priority of exports in the real time based on what was a schedule or awarded in the DFED process. As Prior to the change, the reference was to use the IFM schedule, the IFM award, the Integrated Forward Market Award, as the reference up to the point of what is going to be protected with certain priority in the real time. With the change, effectively, we change the reference to be now based on the rock schedule. And this is the two, the two mm, change uh, process that we have for uh, trading day effective September 5th. Next slide, Jim. Naturally, we have feedback through the regular process of the BPM, and we also get feedback outside the BPM process. And we believe it's going to be a good opportunity to, to discuss this in more detail. Sorry about that. And, uh, as I indicated, the whole idea here is to, to start from scratch. We really want to have a very open discussion and spend the necessary time to be able to introduce all the concepts. Uh, I think it's important not just for the sake of this BPM change that we implemented on September, 1st, no, September 5th, but also potentially to give you a better understanding of how these pieces work together because they are even relevant for the discussion that is going to continue to happen for the instance for the day ahead market enhancement. So I think it's critical that we give this uh, level field to all participants to, to have an opportunity to, to have the same understanding of the current practices. It also helps us because avoids confusion. When confusion exists, <laughs> there may be some mischaracterizations of what is happening in the, in the markets and Obviously, we have an interest to make sure that there is no confusion and mischaracterization of what really happened or how things uh, function in the market. Next slide, Jenny. 
Now, what is the, the objective of this workshop? As I indicated, bring the basics of how the current practice work, but also gain an opportunity for us to understand participants' concerns and questions so that we can really decide what type of um, expansion in the language we may put in the BPM uh, process that is still ready to be completed after we complete these workshops. And obviously there may be some opportunity for discussion that goes beyond what the current practice is. And we are open to have that discussion. We need to obviously ensure that it's in the right place. Uh, this is a workshop to bring you the basics. It's not a workshop to develop policy on the fly, but we will consider any feedback you may have and potentially we have to table those for a more appropriate forum and venue for discussing what may require changes in subsequent uh, uh, processes. And that is really why we are here, what the purpose of the workshop is. And I think uh, we are going to go through the material for, for this workshop. Um, we have uh, Robert Fisher, Rahul Kalaskar, myself, and Anna McKenna. And you will see that we are going to be uh, going back and forth among us to cover specific materials. I can just give you a peace of mind that the people that you have in this workshop today is fully equipped to to address the, the topic. Rahul, Robert, myself had the fortune to work since the beginning when we were ready to implement this Northern Market back in 2007. And we were part of the team that actually did all the factory acceptance testing together with many other people and we did the validation of the price formation, and we have been very close to the functioning of the market. Indeed, our group is the one that is in charge of analyzing and validating all the coordination of the penalty prices that we currently have in the market. So, uh, as I indicated, we are going to be navigating through the deck, and different people may take different areas of exp for explanation. At any time, please, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and we can address that right away if it's applicable to the topic that we are discussing at that point. If we believe, again, that that may be a question that is going to be covered later on, we may defer that question for when the material is right. And based on the questions that we got in previous efforts through the business process manual change and informal questions, we try to address all these questions through the material that we currently have. Still, if you believe that there is a question that is not answered as we go through the material, again, please raise your hand at any time so that we can really try to address those. With that, I think the first part that is important to go through for setting the expectation and the, and the basis of the workshop is starting with the tariff. What is the tariff provision that provides the support for all the penalty prices and the scaling priorities that we have. With that, I will hand it over to Anna McKenna that is going to walk you through the tariff provision that we have for this specific topic. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Anna. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm not going to go into a deep dive of the tariff. Uh, I had about, I don't know, 25, 30 slides just on the tariff. My colleagues told me that I went a little bit too far. Um, there's a lot of information in the tariff, and what I want to do in the next couple of slides is just give you a little bit of a, uh, a roadmap to follow as to where to find things in the tariff. There's been a lot of questions about stuff like that. So I'm going to go through the next two slides fairly quickly. We have in the slide deck that was posted a little bit more detail in the back in the appendix. So. There may be some more information there that you can look at. Um, and so let me start with uh, sort of the, par the uh, how the tariff uh, holds the parameters um, and um, priorities. So as you all know, we have the scheduling pri uh, parameters and the pricing parameters, and they're different for the scheduling and pricing run. Um, and in the tariff has a similar logic and construct, uh, and all the uh, penalty prices or parameters uh, are uh, the, the, uh, pretty much held in Section 27.43 of our tariff. Uh, in Section 27.43, you'll find the 
uh, separate parameters for the ISM, the RUC, and the real-time market processes. And I've listed on this slide the transmission constraints relaxation parameters in the IFM. Uh, and of course, transmission constraints includes more than, uh, transmission constraint itself is a broader term that includes other constraints as well, such as nomograms and stuff like that, that are all part of this uh, section. Then you have the pricing parameters uh, that apply, which are pegged to the current bit caps, and right now it's 1,250 for RUC. Those pricing parameters um, apply separately from the transmission constraints and scheduling uh, parameters, uh, but they're all related and there are, there's a degree of prioritization, and the guys are gonna get dig into that more with you, but I just wanted to highlight that there is a relationship there between those parameters. There's also the uh, IFM pricing parameter for when we run out of supply to meet load, self-scheduled load, often referred to also as, you know, uh, in the real time as the power balance constraint relaxation parameter. We don't call it that in the tariff, we call it some, something else, but in the slide I labeled it that because a lot of you are familiar with that. So 27434 has a real time power balance constraint pricing parameter, again, currently pegged to the bid cap, um, uh, as, as you guys may, may be aware. Uh, we also have a you know, language in the tariff that describes the protection of self-schedules, uh, certain self-schedules at higher priority based on existing transmission contracts or transmission, transmission ownership rights. And so we ensure that in our scheduling run and in our enforcement of, or in relaxation of any non price quantities that we would uh, protect those higher than other self schedules because of the existing contractual rights. Um, the last section I wanted to highlight is 27436, where we have the effectiveness threshold. And this is an important concept that a lot of times, um, you know, is, is, is a little bit um, overlooked, and that is the fact that we will relax and will accept bids until it exceeds uh, the effective, they're not, they're not within the 2% effectiveness threshold. So not every economic bid is effective in relieving a constraint because it could be that a bid coming from a very far location has absolutely no, no effect, and in which case those bids will not be uh, considered and instead we will relax the constraints and the parameters kick in. I wanted to raise that, that threshold is in the tariff as well. So um, I'll pause for a moment, and uh, if there are any questions, I can take some questions now or go to the next slide. Once again, if you would like to join the question queue, you can do so by pressing pound two on your telephone keypad. You'll hear a notification that your line has been unmuted. At that time, please state your name and question. Once again, pressing pound two will place you into the question queue. Uh, we do have one question in the queue as of now. Would you like me to put them through? Yes, please. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hey, Anna. Hey, Guillermo. Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions. On that last point on the effectiveness threshold, um, could you give an example of how that's sort of applicable in the scenarios that we're talking about here? Um, and if that's coming up, um, can just hold that over till later, but it'd be nice to kind of get a, a little real-world flavor for that, too. Yeah, probably we'll hold off because it will come up, I think, in discussions, maybe, maybe a better time when we're looking at specific scenarios. But at a high level, uh, you know, when the idea is that the, the market, the, there may be bids available in the bid stack that uh, may be appear, you know, they're within the economic bid stack, but they may not be sufficiently effective to relieve the constraints, the congestion, or whatever it may be, and it doesn't get, and we wouldn't, um, and Guillermo, please step in if you want to uh, describe this a little bit further, but we wouldn't necessarily select that bid and continue to um, uh, not relax the constraints because it effectively would not uh, be sufficient. Guillermo, did you want to add some to that at a high level, or 
Are we going to get into yeah. that a little bit more? I think this is a good time. And as I indicated earlier, all this is quite interrelated. And just expanding on what Anna indicated, the fact that we have congestion management uh, implies that the market is going to utilize a bit as the controls to determine what resources to move up or down in order to do congestion management. When the market doesn't have enough control variables effectively to move up or down, then we may run into a complication of enforcing certain transmission constraints within the limit. And that may require that now we have to relax or expand or violate the transmission limit to, to make it feasible. And it is here where it plays a, a key role because the, what, are the, what are the elements to strike a balance? Either you relax the constraint at the expense of basically uh, flowing more capacity than what the transition limit can afford, and that consequently is going to lead to certain prices because every time we have a relaxation, we are going to hit this administrative uh, penalty price. And the threshold in specific cases is simply telling us how far deep into the bit stack we're going to rely in order to effectuate that congestion management. If there are some resources that still are available to do congestion management, but they contribute with such a small effectiveness under 2%, the market may not move them accordingly to do the congestion management just because it falls off the, the threshold. So is this balance of what is the consequence of having that threshold in terms of managing and potentially relaxing a transmission constraint? Just to add to that, Yermo, we have a slide coming up that, that we discussed a little bit, the transmission constraint relaxation and the penalty prices associated with that. So um, uh, we'll jump into that a little bit more later on. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah, that's great. Look forward to the, the future discussion, too. And I think that kind of does make sense for how um, the export schedules may get affected by other uh, movements in the system um, and, and the, the explanation around the threshold did make sense there. So thank you. No, um, I don't know if there are any other questions. At this time, there are no further questions in the queue. So before we leave this slide, I wanted to point out an interconnection between the pricing parameters and the scheduling parameters in Section 27.43 and then the priority of schedules uh, when we do relax the transmission constraint. The priorities are actually not in this section. They're in two, uh, three different parts of the tariff. The 31.313 is the priority specifically for when we run, up, run out of a supply to meet load at the aggregation levels. And you'll see some priorities there but the, uh, the Section 31.4 priorities is a complete set of priorities for the uh, day ahead market, and it specifically is for the IFM. The, those priorities uh, apply explicitly to the IFM part of the RUC. There isn't a similar listing of priorities for the RUC. S Section 34.12 then has um, the, the uh, list of priorities for self-schedules uh, in the real-time market. And um, I say self-schedules, but it's really the non-price quantities, which could include things other than self-schedules. Self and so we'll, the guys are going to get into some of those deeper dives, what that consists of uh, later. But that is where those sections are. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So as I was saying, Section 31.4 has the parameters for IFM, and 34.12 has the parameters for the real-time market in terms of the scheduling priorities, and it'll list what we uh, will curtail first uh, from, well, actually from the highest priority to the lower priority, and so actually list what we call curtail last first. Um, so if you look at those priorities, and I, again, I won't get too much into it, I just wanted to highlight that that is where you find the language that we have been, uh, that has, you know, gained some attention with regards to the expert priorities relative to internal load. And at a high level, the load and exports that 
and then this is the only experts that are identified to uh, resources that are not on a RA, uh, that are not resource adequacy resources and they're therefore not like on a supply plan. Those are the resources that have equivalent priority to the exports. The language you see on this slide where it says identified in a resource adequacy plan to be served by RA capacity explicitly identified and linked to a supply plan to the exports. That's actually a very narrow category uh, of, of exports related to uh, our own internal loads, resource accuracy requirements to serve those, a, a specific load that may require that export. But that is very, very limited. Uh, it's the last part of that sentence that I think everybody, uh, not everyone, but has gained some attention given the August event. And that is the governing language that puts certain exports at equivalent priority to load. Everything else that is not explicitly sourced by non-RA resource adequacy would then have lower priority to load, internal load, as well as the other exports, as I just mentioned. And those, those priorities are listed in those two sections are very similar between the day ahead and the real time. Um, I'll pause if there's any questions on that. <clears throat> We do have a question in the queue. I know it's been in there for a little while, so I'm not sure what the topic is on, but I can put them through if you'd like. Probably you were unmuted. Please go ahead. Hey, this is Michelle Keto from the CPC. So I just want to understand this. So is this part which says um, exports explicitly identified in the resource adequacy plan, so you're saying this is exports to a, a type of jurisdictional entity but it's a resource adequacy resource, and that's a very small portion. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's a very small category, and that's yeah, that's not the category though that was you know that we were interested yeah, in I, in our discussions yeah. for the other. Yeah. Okay, I think I understand that. So now I want to get to the other part, which says self-scheduled exports explicitly sourced by non-resource categories. So those are given the same priority of, as load in both the um, IFM and the real time per your tariff? Correct. Okay, and so everything else is given lower priority than load, so if it's not, not explicitly tied to a non-resource adequacy resource? That's right, yes. Okay. Now, there are other things above that, like the ETCs, just to be clear, the yeah. ETCs have higher priority. Yeah, that's different. Okay, but then that's not what happened on the 14th, right? So we didn't give priority to load over the uh, export, the low priority exports. Is that right? And this is why you did this change. I'm trying to just understand. Not quite. The priorities were still the same, but there were, as we move through the day head market um, and going from the IFM to the RUC, the, the next section on this slide, and maybe I'll just jump into that, Michelle, um, is that the, the section 31.8 um, has additional requirements and tariff that we enforce a constraint at inner ties in the RUC process. And, you know, in the, as I mentioned earlier, the tariff does not actually have the priorities specified for the RUC. The IFM priorities are explicit to the IFM. Now, in the RUC, however, what comes out of the day head market is a, our financial um, uh, schedules because they're based on economic bids and self-schedules submitted in the IFM. And, you know, we also have convergence bidding in there. We have, you know, the, uh, the it's just basically economic bids that, you know, folks, folks submit. Um, and we have demand bids as well. Now, when you get to the RUC, um, we're looking at what we, uh, what is physically feasible for reliability. And one of the things we did, and uh, Guillermo was going to get a little bit more into this discussion, but that's where you find 31, in 31.8, the requirement to enforce the constraint. It is through that process that we um, uh, will look at whether or not the um, stuff that comes out of the IFM has is physically feasible. What we found in the August events was that that RUC process, because it was the way it was configured at the time, um, we were relying, uh, it was not 
uh, evaluating the physical feasibility as well as we would want it to have. And so we were establishing those, still those export uh, schedules, feasibility in the RUC. That priority didn't change. We weren't giving those exports higher priority. But as you move through the RUC process, what comes out of the day ahead market, uh, the IFM, and through the RUC process, then you go into the real time, and then you have another set of uh, priorities that start to kick in. And I was going to get into that as well in this slide. So this is actually really good. Michelle is helping me get right. through the slide. <laughs> Sorry, but what I just, I'm coming back to this. Um, but if, if the well, let, let, if let me the, finish this thought. It's, it's, okay. it's important because I just want to make sure. So what comes out of that day ahead schedule, you know, it's everything that got cleared in the market. It, it's not whether or not you have a higher priority or not anymore. That in and of itself, then the output of the day ahead market is used into the real time market as output, regardless of whether or not you were submitted as a export that uh, was explicitly sourced by non-RA. It just got that day ahead priority, goes into the real-time market. Those schedules are protected uh, because they're used as imports into the real-time market. So I think when you say it, those got higher priority than load, yes, those schedules coming out of the day ahead market would have had a higher priority than the real-time schedules. And that's an area as we dig into these slides today, you'll see, you know, there's some questions there as to how we should manage that. But that is currently how it works. And, um, yeah, I just want to make sure I can say that thought because I thought it might be helpful. Uh, okay. But the real-time market tariff that you're talking about, 34.1.2, says in the real-time load should be prioritized over non re um, over the exports that aren't tied to non-resource specific resources. Is that right? Yeah, and there was an additional step, and that's right that for the ones coming into the real-time market as submitted in the real-time market, but that additional step of, you know, what comes out of the day head market in 34.1.1 is because we protect what comes out of the day head market above, what comes into the real-time market as submitted as a bid, that, that it's that additional step that those exports got, get protected. Okay, so even that. though it says, it's, okay, so even though it says load should have higher priority than um, the, ex, those, the exports that we're concerned about, um, you're saying there's another provision that if it comes out of the day ahead market as a self-schedule, we protect that above load. And that's the, that's the crux of the issue, right? Not quite, not quite. I just want to, words, words mean something. So what I said was if it comes out of the day ahead schedule, not as a self-schedule, that comes out as a product of the day ahead, it's been optimized by the day ahead, found to be physically feasible by the RUC, that itself is the output of the day ahead market that is protected at higher priority as for the additional bid. So when you say even though 34.12 says they should be at equal priority, you have to be able to distinguish between what comes out of the day ahead market, which includes exports. So what, like, like, just the same like load coming out of the day head market, just the same as supply. Because if you didn't protect those schedules, you'd be reevaluating everything in the real time market again and completely defeat the whole purpose of the day head market. Now the wiggle room in question we are asking ourselves is, should the, ex the exports coming out of the day head market, you know, should those, because they went into the day head market with different priorities, should also be protected and maybe there's a level of gradation before you get to section 34.12, which is now when you're getting all the new stuff submitted into real-time markets, should there be degrade, uh, different degrees of protection above that? And that's something that, you know, we're looking at and talking about. Uh, but I want to make sure it's clear that section 34.12 is yet another step below, if you wish, what comes out of the day head market because, the, as the tariff says, we take the results of the day head market and protect those as inputs into the real-time market. Okay. And so in terms of the figures that were in the root cause analysis that showed the exports that were high priority, low priority, and economic, were those all in the day ahead market? I, I don't know yes. which figure specifically. Or, yeah, Gamble, yes, please, if you can respond. Yeah, I think we only put a version of the day ahead 
Michelle. Okay, and then is there a, a, a similar figure for the real time? Yeah, there is. There is. You know, obviously, we have the imports and exports in the real time that may be incremental to the day ahead, and we will see. If we have an opportunity to to discuss those so in a public forum. Okay, it would be helpful to see those as well and have the priorities of those as well. So, okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, I'll uh, ask if there's other questions on the line before we move on. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, well, I think with the with Michelle's help, we got through this slide. Uh, that the, Those are the uh, various priorities. And I think I'm done with the tariff slides for now, but I'll be around if there's any questions as we move through the examples um, that we would um, – that we could, uh, you know, we could dig into the, to, to any additional tariff-related questions, but I, I, I don't have full access to, I, I just want to make sure, folks, uh, technologically, it looks like there's a question from Mary Lynch. Um, should I take that question now? It looks like we have some questions. Yeah. All right, let's, let's get a uh, Ethan, questions. if you could check. Yes, please go ahead and, and uh, check on the queue. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi. Hi, this is Carrie Bentley from the Western Power Trading Forum. Please excuse the Hi, Carrie. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering, I'm, I'm sad that we don't get all 22 of your slides, Anna, but um, maybe <laughs> one of the slides um, talked about this, and if so, please point me to the appendix. Um, what section in the tariff talks about um, what goes into real time, whether it's the rock schedule or the day ahead schedule. I've been trying to track the changes and maybe you could just explain it. Is it before it was always the day ahead schedules for all resources that were automatically self-scheduled into real time? And now it's 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 the day ahead for internal but exports for rock? Can you clarify? Yes, yeah, so um and okay, so let, two things. First of all, um, the section 3411 is the section that says we take the inputs out of the day ahead market. That section is not explicit as to how we do it. And so we were previously just doing it based on the outcome of the IFM. The reason why we are now doing it based on 30, uh, the outcome of the RUC is because that is what also an output of the day ahead market. And that is what's physically feasible for those exports coming in. The con that's also based on Section 31.8 constraints, the constraints defining 31.8 at the inner type, and those don't apply to the internal resources. So those, the, 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 uh, the uh, physical feasibility, if you wish, of the, the schedules in the day head aren't affected by that constraint. That's why we've not, we're now proposing, or we are since September 5th, saying we should uh, take that as output of the day head market as a completely, as a whole package, and say that's what's really physically feasible coming out of the day head for the export. So it's 34.11 and 31.8 that have that relationship. I see. Um, if my one suggestion would be if you were to update the tariff, it would be really helpful to put that in one place and make it explicit. Yes, I, I have to admit that we are definitely looking at clarifications that could be made. Um, obviously, you know, these, these sections of the tariff have been barely ever <laughs> at play. <laughs> it's been very little notice, but uh, the August events have put a lot of uh, – onus on these, but yes, I think we are learning a lot about ways to articulate these that are a little bit more clearly for sure. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. I think there's another person on the line. Can you check, please, Ethan? I'm not sure from the chat. Of course, yes. So we have two more questions in the verbal queue at this time. Would you like me to go through both of them? Yes, please. All right. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Josh Arnold from pg and &E. I, ha I have one quick clarifying question, if I might, on the uh, distinction of the self-scheduled exports that are not sourced by resource adequacy or are sourced by non-resource adequacy. How does the CAISA go about determining that status during the market run? I'm just not familiar with that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
at this time, and you know, this has been this way for a long time, but it is basically depend, it, it, we rely on the tariff requirements that the SB can only submit that, uh, can use that option if you wish, submit that bid or self-schedule if they do in fact uh, have a non-RA resource from which they are sourcing that export. Um, it is through representation, uh, through what they submit to the market. Okay, so there is a tariff requirement then that the market participant, if they're self-scheduling the export, must source it from a non-RA resource or from our, mm -hmm. non-RA capacity. Right, based on on, on this on this um, level of priority. With, what we don't have are validation rules in the tariff that allow us to reject the self-schedule if it's not sourced from a non-RA <clears throat> capacity. So if, if they choose that option when they submit that information, it is on them that they must be prepared to, you know, present that. And of course, we would have to go through some investigation to dig that, uh, dig through that. But that would be the expectation. They would be providing false information if you're submitting that export. Okay. Thank you very much. That helps considerably. Um, and then the only other thing I want to say is for Guillermo, I think this is a wonderful topic for a Friday afternoon. <laughs> okay. Okay. So thank, thank you actually very much for, for doing this. I, uh, I'm very, very happy so far that we're, we're, we're discussing this. Thank you. Thank you. And there's All another right. question, please. Yep, moving on to our next caller. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, Anna. This is uh, Sean Neal for M Imperial Irrigation District. And actually, the prior um, speaker, uh, hello, uh, actually asked the question uh, that was on my mind, uh, what uh, probably if there was any definition in the tariff or uh, otherwise as to what explicitly uh, sourced uh, by non-RA capacity uh, meant. And uh, so you've uh, helped answer that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, please? Yep, moving on to our next caller. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hey, this is Michelle Keto again. I'll be quick. Is there any way for the CAISO to ask people to identify the resource as part of that process, just to ensure that it is indeed non-resource capacity, because it would be so easy to check at that point? Yeah, no, that's a good question, Michelle. And I think right now, I'm not sure. Um, that, you know, oh, they, uh, it looks like they do. Uh, Guillermo, would you like to? Um, I'm not sure they actually have to identify the resource. But it is identified. Sorry, I'm getting feedback. Yeah. But it is identified. Yeah, they oh, have to put identified. in the, the soft name. Okay, they have to say okay thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, got it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, and at this time, there are no further questions in the question queue. Okay, so yeah, let's go on to the next slide and I'll let the guys do the fun stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Hi, this is uh, Robert Fisher with Market Validation. Um, I'm going to be taking you through uh, a series of slides that uh, go through the kind of the high level understanding of why uh, we use the penalty crisis for uh, setting priority within the optimization, um, to do some high level explanation of why that works, and then go uh, specifically into the uh, IFM penalty prices, and uh, uh, my colleagues will run through some examples, and then we'll go through some uh, rough penalty prices as well. So, uh, starting out with the, the penalty price explanation, there's a there's a couple of different categories for penalty prices. Uh, scheduling priorities are what uh, resource schedules that are submitted within um, any of the day ahead of real time markets have certain priorities that. Uh, need to be scheduled based upon their uh, level of uh, priority. And then constraint uh, penalty prices are typically used to help kind of keep the optimization within uh, the overgen or undergen condition 
penalty prices for a ceiling and a cap. Um, another constraint penalty price is uh, what we briefly talked about, the uh, transmission constraints. And uh, all those together are used uh, with the incremental bids to uh, help guide the optimization to the proper solution. Uh, next slide, please. So what is a penalty price? So um, as we know, we uh, bids are submitted in the market. Uh, those reflect the willingness to participate. Uh, they have a bid price. Uh, they can be a three-part bid. Uh, that includes startup cost, mid low cost, and incremental uh, bid cost. Um, increment economic energy bids are submitted between our current floor of minus 150 and $1,000 per megawatt hour. Uh, Penalty prices are used to uh, artificially um, give relative priority so that uh, the schedules remain uh, in proper order from uh, highest priority to lowest priority and in conditions where those uh, cases need to be met, those priorities are cut in the proper reference. Uh, penalty price represents an uneconomic signal to utilize only in the market optimization, and it penalizes market solutions to avoid the movement of schedules and consistent outside of the economic range. Penalizing as in setting prices that send the signal of overgen or undergen conditions or high or low prices, needing for incremental or decremental generation. Next slide, please. Uh, how do these penal Penalty prices used in the market. Uh, each scheduling priority for supplier demand has an associated penalty price. Uh, these associated penalty prices are used in the optimization um, to set the priority. Um, as many of you know, um, the optimization is there to minimize the cost. So when setting priority, uh, large uh, negative values are used to assess this priority. Uh, constraints allowed to be on Violated will also have an associated penalty price. So in regards to an undergeneration, overgeneration, relaxation of a transmission constraint or interpipe constraint, these are all constraints allowed um, to be violated based on associated penalty price. When we talk about penalty prices, um, you may hear the term soft limit. A penalty price is really in reference to a soft limit on how the optimization is used. Okay, moving on, next slide, please. Okay, um, in starting with the uh, IFM, uh, this is just an example to kind of lay out how the penalty prices are used for resource schedules. In the IFM, we clear bid and supply with bid and demand. Uh, those are typically priced at um, where those bids meet, but the base layer to those are our self-schedules. So we have our supply self-schedules that are bid in. Um, they represent uh, a price uh, taking price taker for the energy schedules up to that level um, and under generation conditions kick in at a minus 150. The cap is then um, enforced at 1,000. Demand bids or self-schedules are submitted with penalty prices at a higher level than that. Uh, Moving on to the next slide, please. Okay, uh, just to kind of walk you through uh, these penalty prices that we uh, uh, are referencing. Actually, this might be a good point for uh, see if there are any open questions. Uh, just on the high level understanding of what penalty prices uh, are used within the optimization and uh, for understanding. Ethan, is there, are, are there any calls in the queue? At this time, there are no Thanks, calls in the queue, but once again, you can enter the queue by pressing pound two on your telephone keypad. So far, I see no questions in the queue. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we're gonna be going through some uh, of the penalty prices that are in the BPM uh, that's located in section 6.6.5 of the market operations in regards to IFM penalty prices, the rough penalty prices. 
um, given the specific condition and features of each market, there is a set of penalty prices for each market. Um, each market has specific conditions and uh, needs for different penalty prices, so uh, great studies are done to come up with the exact amount um, to determine what value is there, um, but the penalty prices are used to set the priority. So the numerical values themselves may range between the market based upon the size of the solution. So uh, you may see some of those examples when going through this presentation. Uh, lists include main penalty prices that relate to scheduling and constraint priorities. Um, we have also, um, in going through some of the BPM um, process, identified a couple penalty prices that uh, are a bit off. The priority is still correct, but the number that is used within the application is different than the BPM. We are working to update the BPM and get those values updated as well as uh, add some additional um, penalty prices into the BPM that we think would be good for clarification and understanding. So as we go through these presentations, we've identified a couple of those. An asterisk indicates there's a difference between the BPM and the market solution, and a pound indicates that it's currently not listed in the BPM, but we are planning on adding that later on, hopefully shortly. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so these are the lists of the penalty prices. Uh, let me just kind of go through the structure real quick. Uh, on the left is your supply sales schedules and your demand sales schedules for uh, resources. These are resource submitted sales schedules. Um, to break down the uh, tables a little bit more, on the left you see there's a scheduling run priority and a pricing run priority. Um, we'll go into deeper uh, depth of what the difference in between the scheduling and priority, or scheduling run and pricing run are later on in uh, four or five slides later, um, but for now, uh, the explanation for scheduling run is this is the layer in the optimization where the MIP has the binary solution and sets the scheduling priority with a higher penalty price to make sure that the schedules are optimized to the priority that we need. The pricing run will later on set the price because these penalty prices that are used are outside our cap and floor. So we want to make sure that the prices are accurate and properly represent those ranges. Um, so starting with supply, um, we've started with the lowest priority to the highest priority. Um, the lowest priority that is in the ISM is your price taker for uh, generation. Uh, price taker is just a simple PT self schedule that's submitted through cyber. Uh, next layer of complexity is the reliability must take. Uh, that's uh, done at a $1,550 penalty level. From there is pseudo tie layoff energy at a 4000 And then uh, ETCs have varying ranges of uh, priority, um, but they can range the priority that is set within the optimization ranges from 5100 to 5900 and then we have TORs, which are at 5,900, and then uh, legacy reliability must run at 6,000. In the pricing run, those will all be at a minus 150. On the demand side, we have from uh, highest to lowest priority is the TOR, similar to the supply side, um, out of 5,900, and ETC, similar range, but at a positive 5,100 to 5,900, and self-scheduled ISO demand at an 1800 and as what was discussed earlier, the PT exports with the supporting resource that is non-RA energy, or class, excuse me, um, at 1800 So you can see that uh, based on the previous discussion, the self-scheduled demand is at the same level as the uh, export with resource support. Uh, from there, the next uh, Lowest priority is the LPT, or lower priority self schedule. There is no resource uh, support in regards to that, essentially self-scheduling to buy uh, energy from that FM. 
I think I'll ask if there's any questions at this point. Uh, keep in mind there are other layers coming up, but uh, I just wanted to see if there's any questions in regards to this slide. We do have a few questions in the queue. I'll go ahead and put the first caller in. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra Corporation. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something that I, I, I think I heard you say. I was wondering if you could um, expand on it. I thought I heard you say that the relative range of the penalty prices between the different market runs is based on the size of the solution. Do you mean the the amount of the objective function solution? Yes, that's correct. Uh, so what, okay. what I was referring to is the, the bullet in the previous one that the penalty prices may range based upon the market itself. So um, if you think about the size of the optimal objective, day head is going to have the largest optimal objective because it has 24 intervals and um, also takes into consideration um, both supply and demand, so that optimal objective. Now, if you compare that to your five-minute market where the binary decisions have already been made, you're only clearing in incremental supply from committed self schedules, that optimal objective uh, may not be as complex. So other penalty prices may be used. And this is kind of, to determine these penalty prices is kind of a, it's kind of joke around. It's a bit of an art as well as a science to try and get these to be uh, exactly right so that uh, everything is maintained in the proper order. And um, thank you, that was super helpful. Um, and if this next question is not appropriate right now, please let me know. Um, but am I understanding correctly that then Rux relative is smaller because not it's the same time horizon as the 24 hours for the day ahead, um, but it is incremental to the ISM. And does it also have to do with availability bids being smaller uh, of CAP at 250, or is that not a part of it? No, that's uh, that, that is correct. Um, the RUC is going to have different penalty prices, mostly mostly ranging due to the fact that the floor and the cap have now changed within RUC. It uh, is I'll call base layered with the IFM schedules, and then uh, incremental uh, optimization is typically through uh, submitted RUC bids or RA self schedules. Um, we go uh, further into depth in later slides, but uh, I would recommend. Uh, I would hold off for those slides too, as well to okay. help answer Okay, great. No, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, um, that was a really interesting comment, so I thank you for expanding on it. Hey, no, no, you yeah. Yes, yeah, I think this is a very key point that may be very subtle for for the naked eye. And this is important because you are going to realize that we have a set of penalty prices in a very narrow range. And uh, there are implications if we try to have a wider range. And the implication has to do with how quickly and how optimal a solution can be achieved in, in the market. Uh, we, we may think that instead of using 1,500 dollars for a penalty price, we could use $100,000 to ensure that we have a wider range and ensure that all the priorities are in proper order. The outcome of that is that the objective cost function would be huge, and therefore when we try to achieve an optimal solution within the permissible time, uh, the mid gap that determines how close the, you are to the solution may be suffering to really achieve that optimal point. So there are implications of why these penalty prices are in certain ranges, so we don't inflate too much the objective cost function and therefore we result in a suboptimal solution. And this also poses a challenge because if we're in a very narrow range of penalty prices between $1,000, that is the bit cap, up to, I don't know, 5000 6000 that is the highest protection, that means that, yes, through the penalty prices, in concept, we keep certain priorities, certain order, when we have very stressed cases, uh, if we have a difference of penalty prices of 
triptidone as so. These stress conditions may actually put one priority over the other just because of all the interplay that may happen, and that also poses a challenge. So it's important to recognize that there are constraints as to how much we can set up these penalty prices and try to strike the balance between keeping the priorities in place versus still not sacrificing a, an optimal solution. Thank you. Thank you. Were there uh, were there any other questions? Uh, yes, sure. we have a couple of questions still in the queue. Would you like me to go ahead? Yes, please. Caller, you've been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hey, it's Michelle again. Just two quick questions. The first question is on the right hand side for demand. Um, so if 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 load bids in at the cap at a thousand. Um, this means that the low priority self schedule would um, would take priority. Is, is that right? Over bid in demand at a thousand. That that's correct. Yes. Um, any okay. uh, top bid would be a lower priority than a, than a self schedule. And that's that's kind of the the idea that any you know you could bid in uh, a supply bid at a minus 150, but uh, a self schedule will have higher priority than that bid at those uh, cap or uh, floor. Bid prices. Okay, and load is is limited to bidding at the cap, right? At a thousand, if they're yep, bidding. But they can self schedule. Right. Um, yep. Okay, and then my other question is: um, given um, this is all in your um, BPM, um, have you um, provided all the numbers that will be in effect when the soft off our cap increases from a thousand to two thousand, or are these all just doubling? Essentially, they're going to double. Um, the, the idea okay. with that, and that was included in the uh, the, the policy paper. Um, okay, got it. Okay, that's there. all. Okay, so thanks a lot. In the you later part of the appendix. Yep. Okay. Uh, would you like to go to the next question? Yes, please. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. It's Mark Smith of Calpine. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Very good. Thank you. Um, so the, the asterisk and LPT export means that the number that's in the optimization is different than the BPM. Is that, am I reading that right? That is correct. The priority is okay. still um, is still maintained, but that numerical value that's in the BPM is inaccurate in comparison to what is being used in the optimization. Okay, that's fine. So let me ask a real simple question. Let's say that I put in an LPT self-schedule. And the optimization shows a shadow price for that export at fifteen hundred dollars. I think what this means is that the LPT export would be cut, but any PT exports would continue to flow. Is that right? Um, can I hold your questions until two more? I think it's in three more slides. Um, if the penalty price was fifteen hundred, or what? What uh, was fifteen hundred? You, your statement is correct. Um, but in IFM, which is where these penalty prices are are, are currently um, describing, uh, the ICC constraint is set at five thousand. Okay, so it wouldn't be the ITC constraint that would bind the export because that's at five thousand. Okay, I'll hold. I'll okay, hold yeah, as we right. go through that. So what I'm saying is, yeah, I'll, I'll describe it in the next one, but to answer your question, yes, it will cut the um, those self-schedules prior um, if it is needed to be cut in that direction. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there another question? Mm -hmm. Yep, we do have another question in the queue. Holly, you were unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Wei Zhou from SCE. Um, I have uh, a, a few questions. So, so I think the first one is the, uh, in the BPM, you also has a, a scheduling wrong and a pricing wrong parameters or penalty prices for what's called market energy balance. Uh, and then you and then here on the right side, you have a demand self-schedule cut. So what, what are the differences between 
when you cannot meet the uh, market energy price and then self schedule has to be cut. So. That's a very good question. Um, it's actually a good leading question to the next slide um, in regards to constraints. So um, if I could get you to hold that question till we get through the next uh, slide, uh, I, I think that may be helpful in regards to that question. Okay, yeah, sounds good. If you can explain, you know, when each of the uh, two constraints, I mean, two uh, prices, you know, is triggered what happens to the market clearing price, that'd be helpful. For example, yes. if the price, the penalty price for the market energy balance is a trigger, where you would expect the price would be, the market clearing price would be, and what if, you know, the, say, self-schedule cuts the demand, the penalty price would trigger what the price you would uh, market clearing price you would expect that that be helpful. Um, another we question have some, we have some good examples coming up. Okay, great. Another question here. So, for example, here you see the uh, self schedule cash demand, and uh, I guess the next one is a non RA export. Uh, both have uh, eighteen hundred as a scheduling run penalty price. So what happens if both, you know, need to be curtailed, or is, is it like a parietal curtailment? Um, um, that's a very good question. At that point, they would both be marginal. Um, in some cases, depending upon uh, loss components, uh, some load may have a different priority than uh, and then exports and vice versa, but uh, they would be cut uh, at an equal level depending upon how much is needed by the slack variable. And it was that, um, so whatever being cut not needed by the, but how much is needed to uh, to solve the power balance, excuse me. So if if whatever being curtailed, the amount of each being curtailed in the scheduling run will be carried over to the pricing run, or would uh, when you're in the pricing run, you have to relook really at the, for example, only to, you know, if, if we only need to uh, cut a self-schedule of the classic demand or the, you know, non-RA export, if, if if the curtailment already happened in scheduling run, the, the amount being decided in the scheduling run, when you move to the pricing run, do you kind of re-optimize that again or just carry over the quantity the curtailed quantity from scheduling run to the pricing run. In gen we get into this a little bit later um, in regards to the difference between the scheduling and pricing run. Um, the, the short answer is we do re-optimize, but it's a linear aspect um, where we are trying to maintain the schedule priority that is in the scheduling run, um, passing it to the pricing run. But um, I'll, I'll also uh, ask you to just wait till we get, I think it's, maybe another seven or eight slides later we discuss that further in depth. Uh, okay, um, so my last question, I think it probably, if you can confirm, like maybe when you move to the next slide, um, you know, for for the constraint, the penalty price, so if my understanding is if the shadow price, so is a calculated shadow price from optimization, if only if that shadow price exceeds the uh, scheduling run parameter, then the constraint will be relaxed. So if it's, you know, if the calculated shadow price is between the scheduling run price and the pricing run penalty price, then you, you don't relax the constraint. Is that general understanding correct? Yep, the general understanding is correct. Okay, so, so you might have a, so you might have a situation when you are in the pricing run, when you relax the constraint, the shadow price of that constraint probably be the final shadow price, maybe lower that's, that's than, correct. And that's, okay. Yep, that's right. the intent too, because if you, if you take, for example, the the 5,000 example we just briefly talked about for an IPC, you don't want that 5,000 setting the price because that's five times that uh, exceeds the uh, bid cap. So that's why the intent of uh, setting the uh, penalty price back to the cap is intent. Yeah, but I think I'm asking a different question, though. 
I think it's the effect is kind of binary. So if if in the scheduling run your shadow price say you know the calculated shadow price is seven thousand uh, dollars, then you have to relax it, and then in the pricing run you probably bring it back to a thousand dollars. But if the scheduling yep. run had a had a um, you know, calculate shadow price about like $4,000, it won't actually relax it, and that $4,000 may carry over to the pricing run. So I'm trying to confirm if that understanding is correct. Anyway, this is Guillermo. I think I understand your question. Uh, in, and I would explain more the nuances between the scheduling and the pricing run. The genesis of your question is if we could potentially see a shadow price in the price and run that exceeds the $1,000? The answer is yes. Effectively, and numerically, it can be proved that given the specific conditions and interplay of different constraints, the price from the scheduling run inherently becomes the upper cap of what shadow price you may end up in the price and run. Ideally, we have some epsilon, some tolerance bands to ensure that the price is discovered within the same uh, price range that we want to have for the bid cap. But when you really have very corner solutions, the the price easily can exceed the thousand dollars, and that is basically because you are really leaning on the on the on the slack that we have in the price and run, and therefore it can easily go above the thousand. But in here, it's going to be capped by how expensive it was in the scheduling run. Yeah, I, I, thank you, Guillermo. I think uh, it might be helpful if we can have an example to demonstrate, like just a very simple example. Say, you know, a transmit constraint, you know, in one scenario, uh, binding uh, at say seven thousand dollars in a scheduling run, and the other scenario is. You know that same constraint binds in the scheduling run at uh, four thousand dollars, which will not trigger the penalty price for the scheduling run. So, what would be the result you would expect in a pricing run and the two scenarios? Yeah, we may consider that for a subsequent workshop if that happens to be the case. And I can tell you, there are <laughs> the market is a very complex machine, and there are many combinations that you may have to end up in this type of a scenario. And I can tell you another one, for instance, that is very simplistic to, to understand. The fact that we don't optimize interval by interval or hour by hour, that alone, alone can create a very uh, interesting solutions. In some cases, for instance, you may have a constraint that is binding at certain level in, the, in one interval. And what, let's say it's binding for two, three intervals. There may be some bleeding from one interval to the other in terms of the pricing. Or you have multiple constraints binding at the same time, position constraints to say, you may see that there is, there is some migration of the, of the cost from one constraint to the other. And all this has to do with really when you're really working on these edge solutions that there is a lot of interface with, with the slacks that we have in the pricing run. But point I can I have noted that to see if we can come with something in a subsequent workshop if if that is going to be taking place. Yeah, that would be helpful. Another way another another way I was thinking about it is, you know, you brought up a good question like uh, when you see the price in run the price above a thousand dollars. I think from market participant perspective, it's very hard to say. If it's due to you know some parameters being involved, being triggered, or it's just the market uh, solution, so is there any way to provide that information? I think it would be very helpful. I think that'd be yeah, a good thank you for, uh, for the future, like Grandma said. Thank you. Already at this time, we have no further questions in the question queue. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what we previously showed in the, uh, the slide deck was in regards to resource submitted penalty prices. So to maintain the self schedule priority that those self-schedules inherently have. Now, 
this slide is in regards to constraints within the system, specifically related to under or over generation conditions. You will have your constraints, which I kind of consider another bucket of penalty prices, and we'll get into that in the next slide after this. But this one, and most of this, uh, this conversation is about over generation or under generation. So you'll see a lot of the focus in that direction. For this slide, the same structure as before. You can see that on the supply side, the energy supply, uh, energy slack variable is set at 4,900. Um, this is currently not listed in the BPM, um, but we will add it at a later time. That's what the uh, pound signifies. On the demand side, it's a little more interesting. So the demand side is where you're going to get into your under generation conditions. So from highest priority, the slack variable at 4,900 and uh, pricing on price of 1000 From there, the you can see the AS procurement layers, um, which are uh, non-spin would be relaxed prior to spin, and spin would be relaxed prior to regulation up. So you can see going from highest priority at the flat variable down to non-spin at this case. Uh, next slide, please. So what we've done here is we've combined the self-schedule submission with the constraint to kind of give you an idea of how the optimization is going to look at priority. When we talked about supply side, you can now see where in an over-generation condition, the price taker will be cut first, reliability must take self-schedule second, pseudo-tie layoff third, and from there, we would go to the slack variable of the power balance constraint and would not cut into our ETCs or TORs. So while completely unrealistic specifically for the IFM because of the large amount of supply and uh, demand bids, um, this is how those priorities are set. And it also helps lay the groundwork for the future markets like Rock House and FMS. Um, on the demand side, you can see the highest priority uh, TORs and ETCs uh, will not be cut and um, for an under-generation condition, we would go through the uh, LPT exports first, then uh, all PT exports with supporting resource and self-scheduled demand at the same level, and then from there, relax our answer service constraints, and then last, go to the energy slack variable. Um, I think it would be good to open it up to questions um, now. Uh, in the combination now that we've introduced the constraints in in combination with the uh, those schedule penalties. Thanks, Robert. Operator, do we have any questions in the queue? I'm not seeing anything on my end. Uh, there are no questions in the queue at this time. Okay, wonderful. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, in regards to this is. As I mentioned earlier, this, uh, the main focus in uh, a lot of the, the presentation of the, the penalty prices in regards to under-generation, over-generation conditions. Um, just for um, transparency, I, I threw this slide in here because I wanted to um, kind of have a brief discussion about how transmission and TOR and energy, what I call energy-based flow uh, constraints work within the market. Um, the scheduling on penalty price for these is set rather high at five thousand dollars. So to relax that transmission constraint, in order to go to the, the the slack variable of the transmission constraint, that slack variable, um, not related to power balance, but in relationship to the, the calculated flow of that constraint, would be penalized at a five thousand dollars. So similar to what Wei was saying. Um, we could set a shadow price at uh, 4000 which would probably be based upon some effectiveness related to a self-schedule cut um, would be in that range between 1000 and 5000 But um, we talked about the 2% earlier. The 2% effectiveness is related to the calculation of the shift factors. Now, there's a couple of components to 2%. If we were to calculate to see, say, you know, a hundredth of a, a percent of a shift factor, there would be huge 
uh, amounts of shift factor calculations, which would also make the solution quite difficult to solve based upon the amount of uh, resources you're trying to move. Um, so, but you can have a shift uh, shadow, excuse me, shift factor up to one versus the 2% threshold. From there, based upon the economics and your effectiveness, um, the resource will be mitigated um, based upon where you're bid in. Now, when it starts getting into self schedules, that's where you start getting out of that economic bid range and start getting closer and closer to that 5,000. And as we mentioned, um, as Mark brought up, uh, if there is, a, say, only an export LPT and an export PT, so it has a supported resource and one that does not, the priority is, and they both submitted over the limit of the uh, uh, ITC, the LPT would be cut first and then cut partially until the PT where you're at the limit at that point before relaxing that transmission constraint, or excuse me, the inner tie constraint. I think this would be another good point to open and see if there's any questions. At this point in time, I see no questions in the queue, but once again, you can join the queue by pressing pound two. Just give it a second here to see if anybody joins. All right, so far, it looks like we have no callers in the queue. Wonderful. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, you know, I think I'm handing it off to you. My dear, me. Yeah, I was just yes. say. <laughs> I was from here, yes. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Good reason. Good rehearsal. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to switch a little bit on the topic. It's still closely related to penalty prices, but has to do more with how we have set up the, the market optimization. And this topic is important because it is the genesis of one of the changes that we implemented on September 5th. So I will touch on this part on, to explain the, the basics and the, the functioning of this feature. And at the end of the deck, we have more of the practical implications of that change that we had on September 5th. Uh, regardless, if we're talking about the day ahead of the real time, the structure, the design of our market relies on two optimization runs. If we are solving for the hashed market, uh, we still run two optimizations, one that is called the scaling run and another called the pricing run. The same thing happens for IFM, for RAC, you name it. Every single market has this structure. Now, the optimizations that we have are sequential, one right after the other. Indeed, the whole two run is what make up one of the market solutions. We publish results only until we have run these two passes. And why do we have this? structure. The reason is that we have to have a mechanism that allows us to model and numerically apply the priorities that we have for the schedules and also a mechanism that allows us to relax or be soft on certain, on certain constraints that we have in the system. And let me start with something very basic, right? Let's assume that you have a constraint. And if we have certain resources able to move to manage that constraint, let's say it's a transmission constraint, uh, part 26. And we need to enforce the, the limit. We have to be within the limit. But for some reason, let's assume that we cannot find enough movement in the next five minutes to be able to be below the limit. That means the only solution the market can give you is if we exceed the limit or we have a violation of the constraint. Uh, for those that are more familiar with the optimization, there is a very basic classification when you try to solve an optimization problem. Either you have a feasible problem or not, an infeasible problem. Feasible problem is that 
you are able to find a solution that complies with all the constraints, meaning you are able to keep the, all the constraints enforced within the limitation. Infeasible simply means that you are not able, regardless of what combination of these patches you may have, you are not able to come up with a solution that is going to respect all the limits. So in numerical terms, that means that if you have an infeasible solution, that is no solution. Because you have, you have an infeasible problem, you cannot have a solution. Uh, in practical terms, that is a problem. Because we cannot come and say, okay, for this five-minute market, sorry, we are infeasible, we cannot produce any solution. Let's see if we have better chances for the next run. And maybe for the next run, we have the same problem, and you see the, the implications. We cannot just say, okay, we don't have a solution for this hour, for this interval, because it's an infeasible problem. One of the ways we can handle that in practical terms is to allow certain constraints to be relaxed or violated. And effectively, we're saying it's okay to relax the constraint because it's the last resort we have to be able to achieve a solution. It's not a perfect solution that complies with all the constraints, but it's the best we can get. So if we have that mechanism that allows us to relax the constraint, the vehicle to implement that is through penalty prices. The complication, as you have seen from Robert's explanation, is that the penalty prices first have to be above the big cap, and they have to be meaningful enough to ensure the, they are shepherding the, the expected priority, the expected sequence of the schedules to be uh, uh, prioritized. These penalty prices are just a numerical artifact to the optimization to have a way to know what to dispatch first or last. From a practical point of view, these are not economically meaningful prices. Any economically meaningful price is going to be between the bid floor and the bid cap, minus $150 to $1,000. So the penalty prices that are just uh, artificial prices to effectuate the priority, it cannot be used for settlement purposes. That is the whole challenge as to why we need to have two runs. One that is the scheduling run in which we use this set of penalty prices that range from above a thousand all the way up to almost six, seven thousand dollars. Once we have applied those penalty prices to effectuate the expected priorities, and we get a solution that respects those priorities and even the constraint relaxation. We need to come after and try to discover what would be economically meaningful prices. That is the reason we have this second run, that is the pricing run. So effectively, in the scaling run, we go and define the priorities using penalty prices, we get the optimal dispatches. Now in the second run, starting from the scheduling run, we come and we are going to clean up the prices using effectively a factor of the bid cap or the bid flow. And that is the reason when you see the previous slides from Robert about the penalty prices, you have one column for the scheduling run that varies quite a lot in a, in a range versus the column of the pricing run that is basically static. It's either minus 150 or 1,000, because these are the bid caps and the bid floors. That is the reason why we need to have this structure, because we need to have a mechanism that allows us to enforce the priorities and, the, and enabling us the relaxation of constraints. But after that, we need to come with meaningful prices, economically speaking, that are derived from the pricing run. Okay, next slide, Jimmy. And let me start giving you some sense of how this works in the, in the market application. And for that, I have an example here. Uh, I already received some feedback of the prices and the quantities I'm using here. Please keep in mind, through the presentation, we have a lot of toy illustrations. Uh, unless otherwise specified, you should just take this as what they are illustrations, the, the values we are using for the penalty prices or for the bid flow that is indicated may not be reflective of the actual numbers that we have in the system. It's just an illustration. Let's assume the simplest case you can imagine. We have 
two nodes, one transition constraint connecting the two locations. One location, two, has generation and demand, a fixed demand. Let's assume this is a real-time market case. And we have two generators. The generator two on the right-hand side has just an economical bit, let's say from zero to 150 megawatts and a flat bit of $50, one step bit. On the left-hand side, you have one generator that is more sophisticated in the bit structure. It has a capacity of up to 200 megawatts. But for whatever strategy condition this generator has, there is a flexibility we allow in the market. This resource has two components. The first one is a self scale. It is basically signaling that the resource is willing to be dispatch up to 120 megawatts regardless of what the price is going to be. It's a price taker and signaling that willingness to, to be that way. And then the remainder of the capacity from 120 to 200 is with an economical bid of $10. In the first pass, that is the scheduling run, uh, numerically we have to signal or to implement one way or the other the self schedule. That is a higher priority to be dispatched from the supply side over the economical bits of generator two for $50 or generator one for $10 for the incremental capacity. That set of scale has to be higher priority. And how do we achieve that? With the penalty prices that Robert explained. In this case, let's assume the penalty price for self-scheduling generation is $250. And obviously, the supply side, that means the self-scale is indeed on the negative range, the penalty price absolute value is 250, uh, effectively implemented is going to be minus $250. So with that, what you have here for this numerical example is that the bid structure for this generator one is going to have two steps. One, that is the self-schedule protected at $250, from zero up to $120, that is the capacity is being self-scheduled and then the reminder of the capacity with a step of $10. That is the configuration, okay? Next slide, Jimmy. And just for simplicity, uh, we don't consider the other complexities like transition losses or uh, transition uh, constraints uh, be able to be relaxed. We assume that this transition constraint magically is a hard constraint that means it cannot be violated, it has to be enforced. So. If for a moment we ignore the transition constraint, we just do the very basic uh, merit order dispatch, we have a load to meet at 200 megawatts, and we have two generators, one that is willing to be dispatched regardless of the price for $120. We can see that G1 would be able to fully supply the load. The main problem with dispatching G1 all the way up to the capacity is that it wouldn't flow through because we have a limitation on the constraint for 80 megawatts. So that means we have to respect that 80 megawatts flow constraint. What the solution would be? If we look at the, the economics, still, generator 1 is way cheaper than generator 2 because first, it's willing to take any price for the first uh, 120 megawatts and then $10 for the reminder. Here we just need 200 megawatts. The maximum capacity allowed to flow is 80 megawatts. That means generator one that is the cheapest is going to flow 80 megawatts to meet partially this demand. The other resource is going to be dispatched for the reminder of 120 megawatts to meet the 200 megawatts of load. By the time 80 megawatts are flowing through the transmission constraint, the constraint is going to be congested, it's going to be binding, and therefore it's going to have a shadow price. And that shadow price is going to reflect the fact that there is a scarce transmission, and therefore it's going to have a, a value. For every megawatt that you want to flow, there is a cost associated. That is a cost that eventually we use in the day ahead to settle con transmission rights or uh, real-time congestion of set in the real time. In terms of the economics of the solution, obviously the first range is from zero to 120 megawatts at a price of minus 250. So 
This resource, G1, is dispatched at A, so it's partially dispatched in the first segment. That means that segment of minus $250 is, is the marginal segment. And therefore, the price of that segment sets the price for this location one. That is the price for generator one. And that happens to be minus $250. Effectively, what we are doing is that we are reducing the self schedule. The self schedule is 120 megawatts. We cannot honor that. We can only accommodate a flow of 80. Otherwise, we violate the transmission constraint. And when we see the solution, the resource is going to be dispatched at 80 megawatts, and the clearing price is going to be minus $250. That is the price set by the penalty price of the self schedule. Effectively, the penalty price is having a, a binding solution uh, a binding effect on the solution because it's setting the price. And that is precisely the problem I was indicating earlier today. When this penalty price take an active role, the penalty prices are going to be the clearing prices. In this case, the clearing price is minus $250. Let's move to the next slide then, Jimmy. The complication, obviously, is that yes, we will find the optimal solution, that is dispatching 80 megawatts for generator one and the reminder 120 for generator two. What about prices? The price on, on generator two may be okay, it's marginal, but the price at generator one is reflecting a penalty price. And that penalty price is outside the economical range. It's not economically meaningful price. For the sake of an illustration, let's assume the big floor is minus 30. You can plot here minus 150 and it's still the, the same outcome. The big floor now becomes the new penalty price using the pricing run. We're still trying to find the optimal solution that we're going to be published and is going to be financially binding. First, we replace the penalty prices from the set of penalty prices of the scheduling run with the set of penalty prices of the price and run. And effectively, the price and run penalty prices are either the bid floor or the bid cap. In this case, the bid cap is my, uh, bid floor is minus $30. There are some tweaks, some configurations, some setup that we have to do in the price and run to make sure that we get a feasible solution, but most importantly, that we preserve the conditions that generate the right price signal. Remember, in the price, in the schedule and run, the resource was dispatched at 80 megawatts. There are some well-defined setups that we have in the price and run to ensure that we remain with an integral solution. And one of them, for instance, when we're talking about day ahead or HASP or SMM market, is that we do not re-optimize unit commitments. If in the schedule and run, a unit was scaled to be extracted up, we hold that fixed. It's no longer a, a, a decision to be made in the price and run. We are going to be running a whole new optimization with certain points to be already started from the schedule and run. And commitments is one of those. We do not re-optimize commitments. Otherwise, you end up with a completely different solution. That's the first part that we lock. The second part is that we already know that based on the priorities and the schedule that we have from the scheduling run, there is an optimal dispatch that we try to maintain as close as possible in the pricing run. So we have to force the pricing solution to be in this very narrow neighborhood of the scheduling run solution. So if the generator one solution was a dispatch of 80 megawatts, what we do in the setup of the pricing run is that now we impose a lower bound on the range in which this generator can be dispatched. We don't start, start again from zero. That was the original case of the uh, scheduling run. We start basically at the solution of the, of the scheduling run at 80 megawatts. Now, not need to be worried too much about this, but sometimes it makes a subtle difference in terms of the solution. What we have to do is not just go with the 80, but create a small variation, a small epsilon, to ensure that the optimization that has to move and find a solution has still some range to move and be able to get a feasible solution. 
if we fix everything, there will be potentially many cases of infeasible solution because there are not enough movements to find a, a solution. We still have to optimize the whole thing. But we put these bounds, lower bounds. And this is very critical because it is here where the complications start to happen when you have very age cases and solutions. If you observe, the limitation is on the lower end. We are saying this this patch, whatever is going to be from the pricing run, cannot be too far from below the scale from the scheduling run. It could be around eight, but not way farther than that, not much lower than that. However, on the upper side, yeah, you can still dispatch the resource as much as, much as you need because that bit is still available on the upper end. So when we go from the scaling run to the pricing run, depending on what type of solution you have and what interplay you may have with other constraints, you may end up in a solution that is not just 80, but it could be 85. It's not ideal, but it's expected to happen given the configuration that we have for the price and rent. And this is very related to the conditions that we observe on the August heat wave, because the case that we observed in the, in the heat wave was that we have exports. Imagine this type of an export, and the export was curtailed to 80 megawatts. From 120, it was curtailed to 80. When we move into the price and run, the solution of the price and run comes with a with a export a worth of maybe 90 or 100 because it's able to move up, not down, but it's able to move upward. And now the the cut that was properly envisioned in the scale and run is partially or fully unwinded in the price and run. Now, why these changes may happen? Well, because you are changing the configuration. Remember, in the scale and run, you have a priority of minus $250. So that keeps that resource very low, and anything else can move. When we go now into the price and run, we no longer have the $250. Instead, we have the 30 what if you have not just this set uh, scale for the generator and the export, but you also have all the priorities, all the penalty prices for transmission constraints, for power balance, and so on. And everything now converges to basically the bit floor or the bit cap of a 1,000. There is no much priority preserved anymore because everybody somehow priced very closely at the same price of a 1,000. With the fact that we put some hard lower limit, Somehow we contain how widely they can move. They cannot relax beyond or they cannot be cut beyond what the scale and run was because that was what was needed for a feasible solution. But when everybody is at the same bit cap, bit flop, there is a possibility that now the dispatches can go above the scale and run price. And that is exactly what happened for the cases that we observed in the heat wave period that led for us to, to make the effective change of the VPN on September 5th. So this is the configuration, generally speaking, that we have for the pricing run. And now you may start getting a feeling why it creates a difference between the scaling and pricing run. Uh, next slide, Jimmy. When we look at the solution now, based on that setup, obviously G1 is going to be priced at minus $30 and the optimal dispatch is 80, 80 megawatts. This case is simple because there is only one constraint in place, one penalty price at play. Again, the complexity is when you have dozens of other transmission constraints, power balances, and so on and so on, and everybody's converging to the same penalty price of the bit cap of the bit floor, is when we may start having these movements of, and potentially losing some of the, of the cuts that we uh, expected to get from the scheduled run. The solution in terms of dispatches is basically the same. The only difference is the prices. Instead of having a penalty price setting the price at minus $250, the resulting price in the price on the run is minus $30. And what I indicated earlier, the whole purpose of having the price on run is to generate economically minimal, meaningful price. In this case, the minus $30 is a bit slow and it's a meaningful valid price. That is really what happens in the setup of the schedule and run, the price and run. And what we currently do is that we 
and downstream for financially binding the solution based on the pricing runs for IFM and all the real-time markets. The exception for RAP is that now we send effectively the, the solution from, from the scale and run for scales and prices from the price and run. And next, next slide, Jimmy. What are the implications of having this uh, structure of scheduling versus price and run? Obviously, is that the penalty prices are driving the priorities in the scales and relaxation, and that is the whole purpose of having this uh, scheduling run. Each solution on its own, when you look at dispatches and prices from either the scheduling run on its own or the price and run on its own, it's consistent. The scales and prices are consistent. And when in the past, in prior work when, to implementing the prime the primary solution, we were picking the scales from the scale and run, the prices from the price and run, and when you have all this movement, we have some inconsistencies. That was the whole purpose of having this initiative back in 2014, to eliminate that price inconsistency because it was financially impactful and it created uncertainty. And we have some metrics of how much it, uh, it was impacting the, the market solution. Uh, the main challenge is that when you move into using the pricing run on its own, uh, given the fact that we have preset the minimum values for dispatches, uh, you may end up with dispatches that may be above the scales, uh, scale and run prices, and that may create some other complications that we observe. Uh, next the slide, Jimmy. And this brings back to the topic of what the DPM change was. We have this functionality that we call PIME, the Price Inconsistency in Market Enhancement. I, I think we implemented this back in 2013-14. And the whole purpose of that functionality was to eliminate that inconsistency because of using one quantity from the scheduling and one price from the pricing. And that was really... Uh, observe when we look at the DLAP and trading happen locations and the schedules. Uh, the intent of that pioneer functionality was to address that issue related to the aggregated locations. Uh, for consistency, obviously we have one feature in one market. Ideally we want to make sure that the consistency is in place and we apply it across the, the spectrum of the markets that we have, including RAC. Now, when you pause and think about RAC, uh, there is really not much to settle on the labs and trading hubs for RAC. RAC, the only thing that does is give you minimum capacity online that we need based on the forecast. Uh, there may be some resources that are incrementally dispatched with respect to the IFN, and when they are above the RA capacity, this is when effectively we have a settlement for them only for the capacity that is above RA that we call the ROC award. These are the only prices that are meaningful for RAC, not the relapse, not the trading hubs. And that was one of the reasons why we felt confident to make this change. Now, I can tell you, I can foresee us in reviewing later the need to bring back piney functionality to the ROC process. Uh, but we need to be careful to ensure that we gain the best of the two worlds, that we don't create a, a price inconsistency that potentially may be happening here and there for those resources that may have raw cargo capacity, and at the same time we don't lose the, the signal of the priorities and the curtailment that we have for, for the solution that is indicating that we need to have those curtailments. So right now it's completely off for the rough process, we will have to assess later on whether that is going to be the case or we have to bring some modification of the piney functionality back to rock. Uh, next slide, Jim. Okay, uh, I think I'm going to get back to Robert. Before that, let's see if we have any questions. Thanks, Jerome. Um, is there, do we have any Folks in the queue, I'm not saying anything on my end. Uh, we do have one call, uh, caller in the queue. Call that you've been unmuted. Please go ahead. 
Hi, this is Mike Castellano from Energy Division of the CPUC. How's everybody doing? Well, it's Friday, Mike. We are doing fine. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So um, I just there a couple of things you said in there. I think were were a little odd, and I just wanted to ask some clarifying questions about that. Um, you seem to be mm -hmm. suggesting that the penalty parameters of the pricing run are economically meaningful, which um, isn't really true. Those are just arbitrary. They're not entirely arbitrary, but they're administratively chosen numbers, right? So, like, there's there's nothing that makes the one thousand dollar transmission constraint penalty parameter in, say, the pricing run of ISM more economically meaningful than the, I think it's 5,000 in the scheduling run, right? But, uh, let me ask you this. Can a participant bid $1,000? Uh, that's, a, that's a different, you're saying there could be a coincidence in which it's economically, it lines up with a number that's economically meaningful. Um, but the whole purpose, let me pause here because the whole purpose of allowing it to be submitted is because we believe they are expressing their willingness to 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 put power in the system, right? And if we have get over the fact that a thousand dollars is a valid bid, that is economically meaningful. Mm, I think you're you're missing the point a little bit there, but um, that the thousand dollar ceiling is also an arbitrary number that was chosen. I mean, it, that number in and of itself doesn't have anything particularly magic about it. Um, and so I, I think it might be interesting to more thoroughly explore the idea of, um, particularly for RUC, where you're, you're talking about very little money trading and very few things uh, really being paid off this, of keeping some of that prioritization um, in the pricing run because it's, you know, you guys are moving to this idea where you're going to have some things coming out of RUC from the scheduling run and other things from the pricing run, and that kind of inconsistency, I think, is always uh, suboptimal. And there's, you know, it's always hard to predict what's going to go on and what's going to differentiate between those two answers. Um, but there will always be things that are different between those two. But so it seems to me that you could, you could continue to take the numbers, you could continue to take the schedules from the pricing run if you um, change the penalty parameters in the pricing run. Sorry, I, I didn't catch the last part. What did you mean? Oh. You could continue to take schedules from the, or well, you could start taking schedules from the rock pricing run for interties if you, um, tiered the penalty parameters in the pricing run similar to how you have them tiered in the um, the scheduling run. And technically speaking, you don't I mean it doesn't have to be, like I, I understand you're saying you want to keep it near the bid cap, um, but you know, the difference between 250 and 251 might be enough to do that. Right? Yeah. Uh, it's too simplistic, Mike. I, I, I see your overall point, and I think it's a valid point to have further discussions, potentially if we have to make an enhancement to the rock. I think that's a, a good point. Uh, but I wouldn't jump into very simplistic solutions like, yeah, just put an extra dollar, because that will not work. But all what you need to have is a result that has a slightly different losses with respect to other to break that priority. And, it's not going to be okay, but just so. just taking the answer from a different math problem is not simplistic. That seems a little bit. I think you're you're being a little dismissive of um, what's going on here, Guillermo. No, Mike, do I? And let me explain clearly. The simple solution of just adding a dollar to the rock process will not work. I can tell you that. It is not that simple. Simply because I know how the market works, and the point is that one dollar is more than what the losses of two resources, relatively even close, electrically speaking, are going to be. All what you need is that there are losses and that priority will not work. Okay, but there are going to be bigger differences potentially between your pricing run solution and your scheduling run solution, and you're using output from both of those as input to the real-time market now, right? Yeah. And that is the reason so, I was very open to say that 
we have to consider whether there is merit to keep what we currently have or there is an opportunity to improve to potentially have the best of the world. Having the expected cuts that we want to have in that and still preserve the criteria to everybody. Yes, I think that would be a much better solution than the kind of simplistic way of just taking something else you already have, the scheduling run, and pulling the answer out of that. So yeah. I think you guys should work towards that because it makes a lot more sense to me. Yeah, it does. I'm glad you that. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. All right, we do have one more question in the queue if you'd like to go ahead. Follow you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Gilmo. This is the White Zoe from SCE. I just want to follow back on my previous question, like um, the parameter for market energy balance versus the uh, uh, parameter for the self-scheduled demand cut or other like uh, self-scheduled cut. So is it that like a market energy balance is a constraint overall to the market? And you, how often is that happening? Or have we ever had that situation? Because I'm confused about that constraint and you also have the self-scheduled demand cut. Uh, sorry, wait, would you mind to rephrase the question? I was not able to catch it. Oh yeah, no problem. So in the BPM you have a market energy balance constraint, I think which is the first constraint in, in the in the BPM you specify for a, a scheduling run and a pricing run uh, parameters. Okay. And it seems to me that market um, energy balance is something like a power balance constraint. Is it the same? It looks to me it's the same, but if it's not, can you uh, clarify? And also, what does it mean when that constraint binds? Is it different than, uh, say, a self-scheduled demand or self-scheduled export being cut? Can you give some uh, examples of when the market energy balance constraint would bind uh, be relaxed and when the self schedule be triggered or the self schedule cut will be triggered but not the market energy balance. So I was just trying to make sense of sure. why you have both type of uh, uh, constraints and, and self schedule and, and market energy balance constraint. Yeah, uh, wait, sorry, can, can I ask you just to hold a little bit because we actually have examples about that and if it is more related to the scheduling versus pricing run, I think this is the right time to discuss that. But while we go into what comes first and what the sequence is, and we have a lot of material to come ahead of us. But I would like to rather hold for that type of discussion. Oh, okay, sure. I misunderstood you. Um, okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Wei. Do you have any other questions? We have no other questions in the queue at this time. Okay, perfect. Then I think it goes back to Robert. The previous slide. Thanks, please. Chairman. Oh, yeah, previous slide. Thanks, Chairman. Okay, uh, so we talked about the uh, penalty prices that are used in IFM and uh, kind of went through the priority order. You know, went through the scheduling and pricing run. Now, rolling into RUC, it's important to understand what the intent of the residual unit commitment uh, process is. And uh, the idea is you're going to come out of IFM with an economic solution for bid and supply versus bid and demand. But operations is going to come in and say, hey, we don't have enough energy to meet our load forecast, which is what the RUC is there for. So RUC is going to use the IFM supply solution as the base layer for solving the RUC solution to meet, make sure we have enough capacity in real time to meet the load forecast. So we're going to clear incremental capacity to meet load forecast. Over generation in RUC, this is an important aspect because what if IFM clears well above our load forecast? Then we don't really need any RUC capacity. So typically, um, or over generation will be represented at a $0 price. 
In the scheduling run, it will go negative, though, because we'll be cutting into either self-schedules or IFM schedules that cleared higher than uh, what we needed in the forecast. Uh, there's a couple of important rough constraints or ideas to consider when you think about the rough solution. First of all, renewables bid into the IFM, so they may clear at a level that isn't really representative of where their output could be. So because the RUC uh, process is to see the physical aspects of the next day, we use the forecast on the renewables um, to get a better representation of what supply we will have from those variable energy resources. Um, another aspect that is uh, considered is called the REC net short. This is your operations adjustment. Um, this is their, um, how comfortable they are with the forecast. If they think the forecast is a little low, they're going to make an adjustment so that they feel comfortable with enough capacity into real time. The other very important thing that you want to consider is RUC is really an incremental capacity market. So RUC has been programmed to not decommit resources. And this does include multi-stage generators or MSGs. And when it comes to MSGs, we're not going to decommit or transition uh, MSG resource to a lower configuration. It can happen, but only under the condition where that ISM capacity can be held in that lower configuration, or ISM schedule can be held in that lower configuration. Um, so we talked about how IFM is kind of the, the base layer for RUC. The way that is done is through an adder. On the supply side, uh, there is a minus $250 adder that will be built upon, based upon the energy prices submitted in IFM. And I'll go through an example shortly. But it's also important to note that that adder will only be applicable up to a $250 bid, right? So if we were to do an adder, that starts putting bid prices in the positive direction, that may misrepresent our IFM schedules. On the demand side or the exports, the, there is a positive $300 adder. And the reason there's $50 more is to give those exports um, a slight priority when it comes to transmission constraints. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we go about the uh, supply example. So if you take a, an ISM bed, the resource just hypothetically has 100 megawatt uh, Pmax. Uh, the resource bid you can see here, uh, $10, $20, $30, up to 100. And uh, let's say resource cleared at 50 megawatts. So cleared at its uh, $20 bid in price. Now we take that bid and we roll it into RUC. What's gonna happen is we get that adder up to the IFM schedule. And in this case, let's just assume the resource has RA up to the PMAX. So we can see that the bid uh, in RUC is prioritized up to the IFM with a, my a negative price signal for that adder, but it has the same priority as IFM in comparison to other resources because it's an adder on top of its energy bid. So if somebody um, cleared at $10, uh, this resource would uh, uh, be scheduled into prior to that resource uh, that's scheduled at $10. Next slide, please. So now if we take uh, that same adder and we apply it to a demand self schedule, or excuse me, it's not demand self schedule, it's demand schedule. Uh, in this case, because it is a bid, um, or an export, uh, we'll take the example that this is an export bid, uh, 75 megawatt bid. Uh, I have been cleared at 50 megawatts. You can clearly see why the, uh, the bid from uh, zero to 25 was at $1,000, and then from 25 to 50 was at 500, and then from 50 to 75 was at, uh, I think I had it at a dollar. Um, but you can clearly see why it cleared at 50 megawatts. Um, now we take that bid and uh, transfer it into RUC. You can see that uh, the $300 adder clears all the way up to 50. So the section between zero and 25 is at 1300. 
and from 25 to 50 is at 800. Now, you may be wondering what happened to the remaining 25. Well, they only bid into ISM up to 75, and they only cleared 50 megawatts. So that bid of 70, that additional 25 megawatt bid is not into rock. So that's why the bid is only capped at 50 megawatts. Next slide, please. So using the same adder on an LPT cell schedule, we can see that the um, 75 megawatt uh, LPT cell schedule is at the uh, 1150 priority that we described previously. Uh, 75 megawatts is clearly an IFM. Now that cell schedule rolls into RUC, and the uh, penalty price is now at uh, 1450. What's that 300 error? Next slide, please. So using the uh, same, same structure that we had before, uh, kind of going through the, we understand the, how the adder works, and um, now we throw in the self scheduled priorities that pulling in from IFM, as well as the constraints that are used within RUN. So we can see the price taker has that minus 250 from the 400. RMT has the minus 250 added. Basically, all of them have been added. Keep in mind now the energy slack for over generation is 4,900, but we would have to go through pretty much all of ISM uh, schedules before we got to that slack variable for over generation. And then from there, similar to ISM, the ETC, TORs, and legacy reliability would be uh, not cut. More interestingly, um, because RUC is meant as a incremental procurement, on the demand side, we see that uh, still the TORs and ETCs have their um, high priorities. The slack variable in this case is at 1,600. So um, we talked about how between the different markets um, that slack variable may change. Uh, similar to ISM, ZPT with supporting resource has the same priority as the slack or low in this case. So. Um, that's currently not in the BPM, hence the pound, but it is also stated in the BPM for IFM, so um, being consistent between the two. Uh, the 250 with the asterisk is there's an inaccuracy, um, somehow a zero snuck in there without someone noticing, but it is 250 is the uh, pricing run price for that. From there, the uh, as we explained with the adder on the LPT, uh, the 1450. So uh, if we look at cuts in RUC when for under generation conditions, we will go through our LPTs first. And then PT export and energy slack will hit in at the same place. Um, I think that's the last of the RUC slides, so I'll open it up for questions at this point. Already at this time, oh, we just had one question that was just sent into the queue. I'll go ahead and put them through now. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hey, this is Michelle Keto again. Um, I just want to make sure I'm not on mute. Uh, no. Hey, so so um, in terms of what happened on August 14th and 15th versus what you changed on September 5th going into t September 6th, so now we're using the scheduling run, but before we were using the pricing run? That's or we were using the IFN pricing run in RAC? I'm just kind of confused. Maybe you could explain. Yeah, we were using the scheduling run of the RUC solution. You so, were using the scheduling the, run of the RUC solution. Oh, sorry, sorry, I have it backwards. We were using the pricing run. I apologize. We were using the pricing run schedule from the pricing run in RUC. Okay, and so if you were was, using... And now we're using the scheduling run. So if I'm looking at this slide, you were using the adders of 250 versus the penalty prices, or the penalty prices of just 250, so everything was just the same, and now we're differentiating? Yeah, okay. yeah the penalty prices were the same, but... Um, Yermo's, uh, to Yermo's point, you can see that the scheduling and priorities uh, are different in the scheduling on. So the LPT, PT, and SLAC all have a scheduling priority, but then in the pricing run, they have that same 250. So that's where the, the complication arises. 
Okay, so then how is it even solving anything if everything was at the same price? In the scheduling run, it was solving with uh, cuts on the export side. In the pricing run, it would uh, kind of bounce between those marginal aspects all set at the same 250 price. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, we have one more question in the queue. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent. Um, I just have a follow-up question uh, having to do with the penalty prices in the scheduling run for the uh, the higher priority exports, resource-supported exports, and the slack variable that are have the same penalty prices. So, and this may be poor phrasing, so forgive me, but um, I'm just curious. For the, for the exports that are resource supported, if you have a, let's say, a certain amount of them and only a portion need to be cut in order to bring um, the solution back into a feasible solution, how does the market optimization kind of pick the winner or losers within that category of resource supported exports since they're all at the same price? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, for it can bounce between the slack variable or the export, um, but sometimes what can occur is the exports have an additional component for um, the powerful solution that considers losses, which could make the export have a higher or lower priority than the slack at that point. So it will solve up to the needed amount that's uh, to solve the power balance solution by uh, cutting the schedule based upon the penalty or the price set in the scheduling run, which could be affected by losses. If there was a no loss situation, those two would be marginal and it would be uh, um, uh, equal cut between slack and, uh, and or export. Uh, thank you, and um, this may be the wrong direction, so I just want to clarify. So if a resource has higher losses, it would be cut first rather than the lower loss correct. resources? Okay. Higher thank losses as in has a negative loss. Uh, loss. Yeah, negative loss component. Yeah, greater magnitude of loss. <laughs> yeah, awesome, thanks. It looks like we have another caller who's just jumped in the queue. Would you like me to put them through? Yes, please. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, uh, I just wanted to follow up on the Kathleen's question. Can you explain a little bit more how it bounced back and forth between um, the energy slack variable and the exports? And I, I just missed a little bit of your explanation. Can you go through it again? Sure. Uh, so, in the powerful solution, there will be uh, loss components uh, calculated for the uh, export resources. This kind of gives them a possible um, advantage or disadvantage in, when it comes to uh, determining a cut on those PTs or going to the slack variable. If there is a loss penalty factor that causes a negative uh, price that could take it away from that 1600 so say maybe it goes to 1599 at that point that resource because of the loss component will have a, a lower priority and hence will be cut prior to going to the slack now see that makes it could so be it all possible that you have a go ahead say that again no i was just going to say, no, no. say the contrary you could have a positive loss that would put you at 1601 which it would go to Slack in that case yeah. versus an export schedule. Yeah, that was going to be my very next question. Could it go in the other direction? And that's why it bounces back and forth. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Welcome. All right, looks like we have another caller that just jumped in the queue as well. Would you like me to put them through? Yes, please. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. 
Hi, this is Scott Olson with Direct Energy, and just a, hopefully a quick one. Uh, has, in, has CAISO done any backcast analysis for August 14, 15 to determine what the actual dispatch might have looked like if the RUC scheduling run would have been used instead of the pricing run, and if uh, curtailments would have been needed? Cameron, did you want to take that? Yes. Uh, this is a very interesting question, and I think it has more than one dimension. And I think it's hard to try to go into a counterfactual mode of analysis because one may think that, well, if we have this change effectuated for these days, how much we would have further cut and how much we have not allowed to come with the ahead priority into the real time and so on. The reality is that there are more moving pieces, and one of those is that you change the rules, you change the practice, the behavior is going to change. So if we now let participants know that we have this other practice in place, uh, effective for January 14 and 15, naturally we are going to see a different behavior of the bidding for imports and exports. If now they realize that there may be less certainty of passing through exports from the day ahead into the real time, the bidding is going to change, the profile is going to change potentially, even our imports are going to change. The transfer that we have available in the real time with the AIM entities may change because now there is a, a different pool of capacity. So going into this type of uh, different levels of assumptions uh, becomes uh, not so straight and clean. And because of that, I think we have not entertained, and I don't think we, we are going to entertain this counterfactual analysis because there are a lot of assumptions and what ifs that we would have to take, and that would degrade the, the, the conclusions that we may derive. Okay, thank you. All right, we have no further, oh, we do have a, one more question that just popped up as well. I'll go ahead and put them through. Well, you were unmuted, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. This is uh, Kathleen from Vistra again. Um, this is really, really helpful dialogue. I just I wanted to um, turn to the pricing run and um, at the the risk of belaboring what happened in August or not. I'm trying to ask this very generally because I I'm trying to understand the lower priority self schedules that were not resource supported that were that could have been respected if the pricing run results are the final output of the market. In in that scenario, is it because of the losses we were talking about? If there are a, if the LTF is positive, it would be higher than two fifty. So those would have been respected um, and not cut. Hi Catherine, this is Guillermo. Uh, yeah. Let me try to unpack a little bit this. Uh, what we observed for these stress days of August fourteen and fifteen was not just or was only the issue because of marginal losses may play a factor of potentially putting priority above or below relative one from the other. Uh, the problem was not really about that. Uh, only it, it could happen, conceptually it could happen, but I think the, the problem was slightly different in nature. The, the, the main challenge was that when you look at, you are looking at this slide, the the scale and time has all these priorities with a wide range of prices. That allows to keep the the expected priority, right? When we clear the market, we know that most likely are going to be respected because you have a wide uh, range of high penalty prices that allows you to, to achieve that. When we move into the price and range, you see that everything collapses to 250. So, and as I explained earlier today, we put a bound from below that we don't go and cut beyond what the schedule and run cut because that, that was the worst case scenario. You find a solution in the schedule and run, that means you can find at least no worse solution in, in the price and run. That is the genesis to put a bound below. But we don't put a bound above. That means potentially in the rock, we may incrementally dispatch with respect to IFM resources that may have been cut in the scale and run. 
And that is really what happened for these days because what we observed is that in the scheduling run, we may have export service schedules that were contained to some extent. Let's say you have a service schedule uh, export that we put in 200 megawatts and was contained to 100 in the scheduling run. Now when we move into the pricing run, because of this collapsation of the prices from the different penalty prices to 250, and because of all the dynamics that we have in the market of many other constraints playing at the same time, we saw that the containment, instead of being 100 megawatts, may have been 50 megawatts of actually zero. So effectively, the, the dispatch that was achieved in the pricing run for that export may have been bouncing back to what the IFM solution was. That means 200 megawatts. So just between moving between the scaling run into the pricing run, the scaling run was realizing certain cut that was unwinding in the price and run. And because at that time, the solution of the price and run is what we send downstream, the 200 megawatts still was the reference from the rock instead of having the 100 megawatts that had the expected priorities in place. Why that happened? As I indicated above, there is no hard constraint that prevents resources to move up or be cut less in the price and run. The only constraint we put is in the lower end to ensure that we can at least find a better solution in the price and run in terms of having the new reference of prices. These days are interesting because we're not talking just about the set of schedules. There are many constraints at play. You have obviously, for instance, the power balance, right? And if in the in this reference that you have in this slide, if the power balance is 1600 and you have LPT that is 1450, you know that in the present run, the LPT are going to be cut first instead of going into the power balance first. But when you go into the price and run, we lose that type of sensitivity, and now everybody could be in the same place. So I think that was the main challenge of this day that put the light on, on the tiny functionality that we have. And now I think it's going to be important to characterize this because I have had some mischaracterization of this. This was not a bug, a defect, a, a, a problem that we have in the code. It was working exactly as it was designed to work as intended. Uh, when we analyzed the tiny functionality years back, uh, we analyzed the cases, we obviously run stress cases to ensure that it doesn't break on extreme conditions. <laughs> you can never catch all the potential combinations of circumstances that you may have in the real life system. This specific day that was so stressed really was these uh, stretch cases that show that under some conditions like those, you may get this unintended consequence of interplay of different constraints that may put you in this type of situation. Long answer, I don't know if it captures any of your expected answers. <laughs> I, as always, it's an exceptional answer and it's incredibly helpful and uh, I appreciate it very much. Um, you hit kind of early on to the detail that I think I needed, which was that the limiter is not on the upper end, um, the epsilon that we were talking about earlier. So I appreciate you reiterating that and clarifying that point. That's an important point. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any questions in the queue? We have no further questions in the queue. Okay, in that case, I'm going to hand it off to Rahul. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Jim, can you go to the next slide? Okay. Yeah, so, thanks, Rahul. I just want to say, folks, uh, we are getting pressed for time. Sorry, Rahul, but we do have, like, half the deck to go through. I just wanted to tell folks that if we don't get through the whole deck today, you know, it's probably getting late for uh, folks in the East Coast. We appreciate your time. Uh, we'll be sure to address this and continue it on the next call, whether it's a BPM call or another stakeholder call. So thanks for that. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, let me start with some very basic examples. Uh, the purpose of this example is uh, to go over and explain uh, in a very simple scenario uh, the rough setup. Uh, in all of these examples that followed this slide, uh, even though you see a two bus model with some transmission line, we do not consider any transmission line limits. Uh, the main purpose here is to depict how 
the penalty price uh, impact the rough solution. And this solution is especially kept really bare bones so that we can really hone into some of the aspects of how uh, different penalty tries result in different solution and essentially how they impact exports. And uh, all of these examples essentially have a pattern where there are two ge generations that form the supply, uh, and then we have a demand and export uh, coming up in these examples. So let me jump into this first example here. Uh, this first example uh, shows a two generators, G1 and G2, and these two have uh, the supply side, and then we have a fixed demand of 250. Uh, this 250 essentially represents a forecast for a specific hour. Uh, Jimmy, can we go to the next slide? So the next slide essentially shows a, a simple economic dispatch of the economic solution. And uh, just to summarize this case, uh, we have a total supply of 300 megawatts. Uh, there is a fixed demand of 250 megawatts. And uh, at the equilibrium, uh, 20, 250 megawatts of supply clears against the 250 megawatts of demand. And you can see here, G1 clears at 200, G2 clears at 50, uh, demand, fixed demand clears at 250. Uh, the G2 generation is essentially the marginal bid at $600, and that sets the price uh, of 600 for this scenario for all the, both the generators and the demand. Uh, Jimmy, can we move to the next slide? So building on the same example uh, and adding some more complexity, uh, we have added here a 50 megawatt of export at $700. And in addition, we now introduce this concept of slack. Uh, slack is a fictitious uh, supply uh, that we have uh, introduced in the solution and the supply is essentially at the $1,600. The $1,600 represents the power balance or the under procurement penalty price that we have seen in the prior slide. And uh, so looking at the solution for this case, uh, since we have enough supply to meet both the demand and export, uh, the clearing price still falls under the economic range. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, Jimmy. Uh, here we see that the total supply is uh, 500 megawatts, uh, and the fixed demand is 350, and uh, export is 50 megawatts. Uh, we do have a slack of 300 megawatts, that's at $1,500. Uh, that does not play into this solution, but that's introduced just for future case. Uh, the 400 megawatt supply clears both the 350 demand and export, and the uh, generation bid sets the price at uh, $600. Okay. Uh, Jimmy, can we go to the next slide? Okay. Now we introduce uh, a new uh, export bid here. Uh, in this case, export does not submit an economic bid, but it has self-scheduled. Uh, and this is a scenario for RAS, so we have some implication of the self-scheduled penalty price, uh, the way it is coming in from ISM. Uh, and here, again, we have a supply of 300 from G1 and uh, 200 from G2. Uh, G1 bids at $400, and G2 bids at $600. Uh, in this case, uh, you can see that the total demand plus export is greater than the available supply. So essentially, we have to curtail uh, exports, and that's when you're going to see the clearing price go outside the economic range. So uh, can we go to the next slide, Jim?
So here the total bid in supply is 500 megawatts, uh, and the fixed demand is 450, and the export sales schedule is 100. Uh, the export act had a 100 megawatt award in IFM, and the sales schedule was of type LPT, which is lower priority. That essentially means that this export did not have a non-RA supporting resource. And now when you look at the penalty price that we have in RUC, uh, the RUC penalty price is at 1450. And the way we construct that penalty price is the sub schedule was uh, at 1150 in IFM. And as Robert mentioned before, we have a $300 adder. Uh, when you combine those two, the uh, LPT penalty price becomes 1450. And uh, at the solution, what we get is uh, 300 plus 200 megawatts of supply is able to clear only 450 megawatts of demand and 50 megawatts of export. The 50 megawatt of export is curtailed uh, in order to have a feasible solution. And uh, the marginal price is set at $1.1450. As we have discussed before, these prices, even though are outside the economic range, uh, we can get those prices in the scheduling run because we have a second run, the pricing run, where we put the price bounds and uh, we get the uh, solution in the pricing run, we get the price uh, in a much economic range. Uh, let me pause here and see if there are any questions. Thanks, Rahul. Uh, operator, I'm not seeing anything on my end. I'm not sure if we have any questions. Thank you. At this time, we have no questions in the verbal queue. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, Rahul. Yeah. Maybe Wei can bring the question that he was trying to ask earlier. I think this may be a better uh, set point to to have that discussion. Wei, do, do you want to bring your question? Thanks, Gary. Well, yeah, Wei, uh, push pound two. That way, if you're still there, the, you can identify your line. may have lost them. So it does look like we have one question that did jump in the queue, or two now. <clears throat> we can go to the question. Okay. And you said we may have lost somebody on the phone line. I'll keep an eye out um, see you when they dial back in. Okay. So if there's no questions, I think we can move on. Hi, uh, this is Wei. Can you hear me? Yes, Wei. Hi, Rahul. Uh, so, yeah, okay, um, so, um, I think maybe it's in your next slide. I'm not sure. Because my question is basically, yeah, relationship of the market energy uh, balance constraint um, and how that interacts with the uh, self schedule demand or export being cut. Yeah, maybe I can walk through this and then we can uh, go through that question. Okay, sounds good. Okay. So, let me go through this example uh, and then we can see if there are any additional questions. Uh, so, we continue with the similar setup and now we increase the fixed demand uh, from the previous example of uh, 450 to now 550. Now, once the demand completely exceeds the available supply, uh, we have uh, an economic decision to make. Uh, how do we get a feasible solution? So we look at all the prices that are available for the optimization engine. Uh, the, we go from the uh, lowest price, we cut those, and then we go to the next uh, higher price on the uh, demand and supply side. So can we go to the next slide? Uh, 
So in this case, the total bidding supply is uh, 500 megawatts, and the fixed demand is 550. And the export LPT is 100 megawatts, and that is at 1450. So as you can see, market is first going to cut all the exports uh, of 1450. Next, since demand is fixed, we really cannot move the demand. And at the same time, we really don't have enough supply to meet the demand. So then we use the SLAC. The SLAC is the uh, undergen uh, penalty price that is published in our BPM at 1600. And at this point, uh, we clear the 550 megawatt of demand and we take 50 megawatt from the SLAC. And the physical interpretation of this uh, is that now we are actually going short. And uh, what this implies or this gives a signal coming out of RUC is if we have a power balance and feasibility in RUC, then it gives a signal to our operators to start looking at various options and uh, try to call for energy conservation and all of those other processes that we have whenever we get these uh, power balance and feasibility. So maybe we can stop here and see, Ray, if you still have any questions. Hi, Rafa, this is the way though from SC. Um So, I think here you basically um, the uh, market energy balance constrain the, the parameter price of sixteen hundred dollars. Um, yeah. And it, but I think in the IFM it's it's very high. It's like a sixteen or maybe uh, let me see. Uh, in the yeah. IFM it's like a sixty five hundred um, dollars. So I was just trying to make sure. And, and in the IFM, it's the self schedule penalty was eighteen hundred dollars. So it's kind of a big gap between the two. But here, I think it's actually at the same penalty price for the rug. So I was wondering, you know, if it, you know, I think maybe this is not a good example to say what's the difference between the two. But I was my question originally was on the IFM, um, where you see kind of the two different penalty prices. So from an ISM perspective, I think 1800 is for self-scheduled demand, and export uh, is, the LPT export is much lower. So market is going to curtail LPT export first before we go and cut self-scheduled demand. So it is, so when does the market? Uh, energy balance constraint will be triggered in the IFM. It's so only if you... In IFM, in IFM, we do not expect the power balance constraint to kick in. We expect we would curtail bid self-scheduled demand or bid-in demand before we even go there. Uh, so, okay, so I'm, I'm trying to understand the, the point. So you, you do have the market energy balance constraint in the IFM, but you do not expect that constraint going to bind in any scenario? No, not until we exhaust all the demand that we did. Well, the they have quite different in terms of the rest of the market, right? Because in the other market, we have effectively a inflexible demand that we cannot uh, that is not quite responsive. The way ahead is kind of different because either you have exports that are either self-scheduled or economical, you have a bidding demand that is either economical or self-scheduled. So before reaching infeasibility, you have a whole world of flexibility and variables to, to reduce your power balance to, to be balanced. Okay, okay, so, okay, that's helpful. So in the day market, you generally do not expect the power balance constraint going to bind at all. Uh, so the power balance constraint is more relevant to the rug and 
and, and the real time market because they are more uh, a low forecast at that stage, and the penalty prices are much lower than what's being set in the data market. Is, is that a, a correct? Yes, I, I, yes, I think the principal statement is correct. Let me just make a little clarification because I think it's a matter of semantics. Uh, the power balance constraints bind all the time because it's an equality constraint. And either it's going to be relaxed even in the real time, it's still is going to be binding. And that is the reason we always have a SMEC price. That is a system marginal energy component. Uh, that is different when we say that it's going to be relaxed. And I think we are talking more about when it's relaxed because it binds all the time. Okay. Okay, I see. Thank you. Are there any other questions? We have one other question in the queue. I'll go ahead and put them through now. Oh, you were unmuted. Please go ahead. Uh, you know, you've answered my questions already. Thank you. Okay. So then, let's move on to. Are there any questions? We have no further questions at this time. Thank you. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, now we are trans we are done with rough and we transition from. Uh, they had to have, and has uh, the main purpose of has is to uh, is basically to issue predescribed instructions to hourly block energy uh, resources or system resources transactions, and for hourly ancillary service bids. The hourhead scheduling process is essentially described in detail in Market Operations BPM Section 7.5. Uh, the main inputs that go into the HAS run is the CAISO demand forecast, the day ahead market cleared and self scheduled supply and demand, uh, economic and self scheduled supply and exports, and VER forecast. And then we also have similar constraints in HAS, similar to RUC. Uh, it is a multi interval SUC optimization. Uh, we have a power balance constraint the intertie constraints, transmission security constraints, and also self-schedule priorities. Jim, can you go to the next slide? Uh, this slide essentially shows uh, the market timeline. The bids for uh, the trade hour closes at T minus 7.5, and then the hash process starts at uh, T minus 71.5, and uh, essentially, the half run has uh, seven 15 minute interval market awards. And the hour head scheduling process is essentially the four 15 minute interval awards for the trading hour T to T plus 60 that's shown in this chart. Jimmy, can we go to the next slide? Okay. So, this is a similar picture to what we saw for the penalty prices uh, for RUC. Uh, this shows the tables for HAT. Uh, I don't want to go through all of the priorities, but want to highlight some key numbers here. Uh, as you can see, the energy slack variable for oversupply on the supply side is a negative 1450. And then the demand side uh, is also changed. It's positive 1450. As compared to in RUC, uh, the undergen or uh, energy slack variable for undergen was 1600. And then you will see similar priorities on both supply and demand side. Uh, just of note, the market is essentially going to curtail uh, price taker supply before it's going to curtail RMR, uh, liability must take, uh, pseudo tie, uh, layoff energy, ETC, QR. And on the demand side, similar QR uh, exports are protected the most. Uh, then it's ETCC, uh, contract 
The next key penalty price here is the dollar fifteen hundred uh, penalty price used uh, to show uh, what cleared in uh, they had, and uh, there is a clear distinction uh, change that we made to the BPN twelve eighty two PRR, uh, where uh, I have an example where we will show what is the implication of that change. And uh, finally, two other priority of the penalty prices of note, uh, the PTE exports, which are supported by uh, RA, non-RA resources, they are at the same penalty price as the uh, underken slack variable at 14.50. And then the LPT exports have the lowest priority, uh, it's at 11.50. Jimmy, can you go to the next slide? Do you want to cover this? Yeah, let's see if we have any questions so far, Rahul, before we move into the next topic. Sure. Operator, do we have any questions? At this time, we have no questions in the queue. Okay. Uh, let me just... I think we have lost Anna at this point, but... Uh, the idea is that prior to going into the next uh, set of slides that is more specific to the changes that we implemented on September 5th, uh, we want to put this reference of the, the expectation for the rock, rock outcome. And this goes back all the way to the implementation of our quarter 764 and the implementation of the 15-minute market. At that time, we had some extensive discussion with participants, and I think in the next slide there is a reference to the questions and answers that we memorialized in a document. And the expectation is that given the fact that rock is going to be the physical-based market based on the projected area head forecast that we have for the CAISO area based on physical supply, that is the best representation we have in the day ahead time frame of what could be feasible for, for the real-time market. That is the best information we have. And generally speaking, we are going to expect that there may be incremental changes because obviously IFM is going to be clearing based on the bidding demand, including the convergence bids. Now we're going to work it's on the physical market against the forecast. Naturally, there may be variation, whether we require the incremental capacity or less capacity. And in some cases, uh, there may be a difference, not just about capacity or energy between IFM and RAC, but in some cases there could be also implications of congestion. Uh, the congestion that may be realized in the RAC market may be closer to the physical congestion that may happen in the real time and maybe it's slightly different to what happened in IFM given these other variables. And there was this item that came along this implementation of the first quarter 764 in, in regards to the rock consideration. And the discussion we had back in 2014 is that the rock, not just about capacity, in, in terms of capacity terms, but also in terms of feasibility of dispatches, is the best representation we have. And that is the reason we have the expectation uh, set up that the rocket scales, even for intertie, would be the best representation we have of what could potentially be feasible going into the real-time market. And therefore, there was an expectation that the day ahead solution, specifically the rock solution, would be the best reference of what could be used for tagging the day ahead time frame. Uh, and this is one of the foundations as to why we are relying on ROC to be the reference to what can come into the real time, simply because as an explainer, is the representation of what is physically feasible. And next slide, Jimmy. If you want to read more about the history of the discussion and the level of detail that we provide, I would encourage you just to go through the Q&A that we posted. 
I believe what we have realized is that we should have done a better job of keeping track of the discussion and the material we posted at that time. Uh, we should have put some of this information actually in the BPM, and we did not, and we, we came short of that. I think now that we're going through this uh, discussion, it is due for us to to expand the language and include not just um, the discussion we're having about these uh, implications of the export treatment and so on, but also some information that is contained in this uh, Q&A. So in the next round of the BPM process that we have for this 1282, I think we're going to put some more information to make a complete picture. Okay, with that, I will get back to Rahul and Robert. Give me next slide. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start with uh, the hash BPM change. Uh, a little bit of background about uh, rock and hash. Uh, so the day ahead market consists of uh, both the IFM market, which is the financial solution, and the uh, residual uh, unit commitment, RUC, which is essentially looking for the physical or more feasible solution. And each one has its own uh, schedule. Now, IFM schedules are specific for energy, and the RUC schedules above IFM essentially get paid uh, for their capacity and are required to bid into the real-time market. Now, participants with the day-ahead position can essentially self-schedule their day-ahead position in real-time. Uh, the tariff section 3.18 requires that export schedules up to the clear drug schedule determine what part of day-ahead uh, schedule is feasible. So, this BPM change clarifies that going forward, ISO will provide day ahead priority to export based on rough supported amounts uh, for the real time market. And the crux or the core reason for changing this was to ensure that once we have whatever we cleared from RUC, that becomes uh, as a basis or input to our real time market because those are the feasible solution based on the forecast and not necessarily the IFM, uh, because IFM is purely financial uh, market at that time. Uh, Jimmy, can we go to the next slide? So uh, just to, you know, to emphasize more on what has changed, so this is how the market was treating uh, exports before the BPN change. So RUC assesses the need to curtail the export and may also curtail the export below the ISM award. Now in half, the market, if the export schedule came into real-time market and they self schedule, then the market would use the day ahead award to determine if they should get the day ahead priority. And uh, essentially from a bidding process or from a cyber process, uh, if an intertie transaction or a system resource received an IFM award but had no RUC award, uh, or rather if its RUC award were curtailed, and SC did not submit a real-time bid for that intertie resource or transaction, Cyber would create a self schedule uh, equal to the IFM schedule. And uh, we can take a look at an example and see exactly what these words mean. So, Jimmy, can we go to the next slide? So, here, uh, this is an example, uh, and the premise for these examples are similar to what we had in the RUC case. Uh, we have two generators, G1 and G2. Uh, they are 300 megawatts and 250 megawatts, respectively, and their bidding price is $400 and $600, respectively. Uh, here, you can see the slack. Uh, slack instead of uh, 1,600, now it's 1,450, uh, that's in half. And then we have a fixed demand uh, of 400 megawatts. The 400 megawatt demand essentially represents a load forecast for a specific time interval. And then we have two exports, 
E1 and E2. The E1 export essentially had a 100 megawatt of schedule in IFM, and E2 did not have a schedule in either IFM or RAC. And uh, if we go to the next slide, we will see what is the solution for this case. Uh, so in this case, essentially we see that the total bid-in supply is 550 megawatts, the fixed demand of 400 megawatts, and the two export sub-schedules of 100. Uh, we mentioned that E1 had 100 megawatt of IFM award and zero megawatt of RUC award. And SC does not submit a bid in real time, so Fiber creates a 100 megawatt self schedule with a day head priority. And as you can see, the day head priority is set to 1500. This is something we saw in the table when we saw the half penalty prices. E2 uh, does not have a IFM or RUC award. And once E2 submits a real-time sub-schedule and does not have a non-RA supporting resource, it gets a penalty price of LPT at 1150. And just to make everything, uh, you know, clear, the order or uh, the penalty price order is essentially you have day head priority at 1500 is greater than the slack at 1450. And the 1450 slack is greater than the LPT penalty price at 1150. So at the equilibrium or when we solve this case for economic dispatch, we see generator G1 clears at 300, G2 clears at 250. Now the fixed demand clears at 400, and the export, the day head export, clears at 100 because it has a higher priority but we have to curtail the real-time LPT sub schedule because it has the lowest priority at 1150. And uh, at the equilibrium, the marginal price essentially is 1150. That is set by the penalty price for E2. Uh, Jimmy, can we go to the next slide? Uh, now we move on to what was the change uh, that we implemented. So after the change, what we did was in the hash market, we would use the self schedule up to rock award to have the day head priority. And essentially this is to reflect uh, that we believe RUC is the most feasible solution and that should be the starting point for hash. Uh, and in case if uh, a resource does not submit a bid in real time, and it has a IFM and a RUC award, then Cyber would not create a self-schedule for imports. And for exports, it would create a self-schedule equal to the RUC schedule. And what that essentially means is if an IFM resource, in IFM resource had a 100 megawatt award, uh, but in RUC it's zero, you are end up going to, you're going to see that the self schedule now will be the zero megawatt. Uh, of course, uh, the SC still has the ability to submit a self schedule in real time. And if it's self scheduled in real time, it can self schedule at PT or LPT. So let's go through a couple of examples and see exactly how these things work out. Jimmy, can you go to the next slide? You know, moving on to the same examples, and uh, let's look at some key changes that we observed from the hash example before the BPM change. Now, in the prior example, similar to prior example, we have two supply bids, 300 megawatts and 200 megawatts respectively, and their uh, bid-in price is $400 and $600. We still have the same fixed demand bid of uh, $400, uh, and then we have and E2 is again has a 100 megawatt at LPT, but now for E1, uh, even though the resource had a 100 megawatt award in ISM, you see here the self schedule is at zero. And let's go to the next slide and see exactly why that turns out. Okay. Uh, so, you know, just to recap a few things, we have a total supply of 550. 
the bid in demand, or rather, sorry, the fixed demand is at 400 megawatts, and we have two exports. One export is at zero, and the second export is 100 megawatts. The key example, or key thing to note for the change is, even though E1 had a 100 megawatt of ISM award, in RUC, its exports were curtailed to zero. And since the SP here does not create a bid or submit a bid, Cyber creates a zero megawatt sub schedule uh, based on its RUC award of zero. And it still has a penalty price of 1,500, but at zero megawatt. Uh, similar to the previous example, E2 has no IFM or RUC award, and then E2 penalty price is at 1,150. In this case, what we observe is we have sufficient supply to meet both the demand and the export. So essentially, we see that the total uh, 500 megawatt of supply clears against 400 megawatt of uh, fixed demand, 100 megawatts of LPT export, and the LNP now is uh, $600. Uh, Jimmy, let's go to the next example, and after that, we can take questions. Can we go to the next? Yeah. Uh, in this slide, it's exactly the same example. Uh, we have E1, which had IFM award of 100, uh, RUC award of zero, but now the SP submits a 100 megawatt of uh, self schedule for real time. Uh, Jimmy, can we go to the next slide? Uh, and so I'll just skip through all the details and go over some key points. Uh, what happens in this scenario is we have two sub-schedules of 100 megawatts at uh, essentially uh, 1150, and that's of the penalty price LPT. Uh, and the market essentially clears the total supply of uh, 550 megawatts, and then you have the demand clear at 400, and then each of the exports, they get cleared at 75 megawatts because they both have exactly the same uh, penalty price of 1150. And in this case, the 1150 is the marginal bid, and thus 1150 sets the price. Uh, I think we can pause here and see if there are any questions. Thanks, Rahul. Yeah, this might be a good time for any final questions as we wrap up, folks. Appreciate your flexibility. We do have a couple of questions in the queue at this time. Would you like me to put them through? Yes, please. Paul, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Carrie Batley with the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, thanks for walking through these examples. They're really helpful. I was wondering if you've done any um, assessment of the impact of this so far, and maybe this isn't, maybe this is something for the next call, um, but our members have reported um, being cut in RUC, having their exports cut, um, a, I would say a shocking amount of time, uh, given the, just what you've walked through. It seems like the impact would only be during really constrained conditions, but that isn't what I think market participants are seeing, and I'm wondering if you have any analysis on that or plan to provide any analysis on the uh, real-world impacts of this change. Thanks. Yes, Gary, thank you for bringing that question. Yes, we do expect to have material for that. Uh, I think we need just to find out what the next opportunity to, to show and discuss that information will be. Um, sorry, Jeremy, uh, can you say that last part again? Um, I heard something quickly, but I missed what you said before that. Yes, yeah, we are expecting to to have some analysis and metrics and available. We just need to find out what the discussion is going to be, whether the MPPF or another workshop, just find a public forum to discuss. I see. Great. Thank you very much. All right, would you like me to move on to the next caller? Yes, please. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. 
Hey, this is Michelle again from CPC. Hopefully this is a quick question. Um, does the marginal price set in the scheduling run um, go into the pricing run? Does it actually clear at 1150 then? No, at this point, uh, we have to revert everything back uh, and use the penalty, all the penalty prices from uh, the pricing run. And then we recalculate the price similar to the example that Guillermo had before. Okay, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Yes, we have two other callers in the queue at this time. Next caller, you have been unmuted. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, this is Sean Neal for Imperial Irrigation District. Uh, I had a question, uh, maybe um, heat up for further discussion next time, but I'd like some more explanation as to how um, the uh, how e tags uh, work as between the day ahead and uh, the HASP in real time. Uh, you know, there's discussion that the um, uh, the rut constraint kind of determines what day ahead schedules can have an e tag submitted in the day ahead and Occurs as to what uh, what can be done, what happens to those e tags as uh, you go through the next through the pricing run and then into the house in real time. Yeah, I think this is a good question follow up uh, for uh, the next call, uh, and we have some information in the FAQ that was provided in the prior link, uh, but I think we can consider that for future discussion. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sure. All right. We have one other question in the queue at this time. Holly, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. This is Wei from AC. Uh, this will probably be a very quick uh, clarified question. I think you mentioned about the 300 megawatts lack at uh, the high price. Uh, you probably said something that I didn't catch. Can you say one more time uh, where the 300 megawatts come from? Is that like a tied to regulation requirement, or is it something so, else? Um, I think this goes back to two things. Uh, first, one of the this in Guillermo's explanation where he mentioned that we always want to come out of the solution with a feasible solution rather than having infeasible. So we use this slack as an indication to tell us, uh, you know, what, what, how stressed is the system. The 300 megawatts of slack uh, in real time uh, sometimes can be approximated as something that we could rely on uh, regulation. But if we see higher power balance relaxation in the real time market, then it's essentially an indication for us that system conditions are really stressed and our operators have to take decisions of what they need to do next. Okay, thank you. We have uh, one more question in the queue at this time. Would you like me to put them through? Sure. Caller, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Guillermo. This is Ian White with Shell Energy. Uh, I just want to uh, take some time and thank everyone for this uh, good discussion here today. Um, I have more of a comment. Um, uh, I w we would appreciate a second stakeholder session on this where we can really suss out um, some of the um, impacts to other external balancing authorities that this um, this may this change may uh, have um, contributed to, um, as well as kind of the disconnect between market rules and the impacts uh, um, uh, due to uh, the impacts on tagging requirements uh, for NERC and WEC reliability standards. Um, so again, just thank you, and, and certainly looking forward to a second discussion that we can really get into a little bit more of a dialogue. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. I think we are very open to, to see what else we need to, to have for our discussion in the next round. Thank you. All right, we do have one other question that has just jumped in. Can I go ahead and put them through? Sure. Paul, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. 
Hey, Guillermo, Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions again, um, and also echoing the thanks for this. It's been a very helpful meeting. And just teeing up for next time, um, do you want folks to just submit um, a kind of follow-up questions to help kind of shape the scope of the next meeting? Um, I'm particularly curious about um, the impacts of operator interventions, either transitioning from RUC into the real-time market or even from HASP into FMM and how that plays sort of into the uh, context of all of this. But I'm, I'm sure as we all kind of think about the discussion for the day, we may come up with a handful of others. I'm just curious how we um, uh, talk to you about uh, having that shape the scope of the next meeting. Yes, and thank you. <laughs> I think I was thinking about that by the time I was listening. And I think we may need to work out with Jim and see how we can work out the logistics to make sure that we are able to get the feedback from anybody that has a, an item for suggestion. And I, I think we, we would have to figure out most likely going to be just through the stakeholder uh, pathway that we typically have. And we, we want to hear from you in where do you believe that this is still an area of interest and we are still need, need to cover? But I think we need to do it consistently so that we don't miss any, any feedback. I think we will communicate maybe through a market notice how you can submit a comment so that we, we capture all of those. That's great. And then also just a, another suggestion there is around you know, when you talked about the PIME logic and potentially needing to change it under RUC in the, in the future, it, it brought to mind kind of you know, changes being proposed in the day ahead market enhancements, the, the potential outcomes from a scarcity pricing initiative, um, thinking about price performance and some of those other things. Just um, it, it'd be good in the next meeting to have some uh, forward thinking about um, you know, how these changes may um, you know, get impacted by other things that are in the, the policy roadmap right now and, and things you see coming in the next few years. Oh, yeah, I think that's a, a key point, and I appreciate the feedback, and I believe this is one of the reasons we wanted to, to level the field of understanding so that participants can be better equipped to have an engaged discussion in the uh, policy uh, efforts that we have, such as the data head marketing. And so this is timely, and I appreciate that point of view. Okay, thank you. All right, I think that's it for questions in the queue. Is that correct, operator? Uh, yes, there are no longer any questions in the queue. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for all the time job, but I think it's the time to uh, maybe stop and continue this on the next call, whether it's the next BPM call. I think it's scheduled for this December 15th, if I'm looking at that correctly, or on another stakeholder call. You know, if we see that would be needed, of course, we appreciate that feedback, and we'll take that into consideration. Um, as Guillermo mentioned, please look out for any marking notices to announce any announcements outside of our BPM process right now. Um, but again, we do really appreciate the time uh, you folks have taken this afternoon, especially given the current events to uh, listen in today. We hope it was a helpful discussion. And this was recorded, as mentioned. You can look for that to be posted onto the miscellaneous stakeholder meetings page underneath this presentation. And just as an FYI, we do have the policy roadmap uh, final roadmap for 2021 call is on Monday uh, for any folks interested on in joining that if they are uh, wanting to raise questions in regards to this too. Um, so once again, thanks folks, and uh, please, please have a great rest of your day and have a great weekend. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. You may now disconnect.